Okay, I think we're set to go. Um, welcome, everybody. It is uh, 6.31 p.m. and I'll call the meeting to order. And I'll start by asking the uh, ad, uh, council members participating remotely to uh, introduce themselves. Oh, Sal Alfano, District 2. Adrian Gill, District 1. Carrie Brown, District Three. Okay, thank you. And uh, Councillor Hurl is not not going to be here tonight, um, which we already knew. So tonight, I'll just briefly go over the uh, meeting logistics. If you are uh, joining us remotely, we would ask you to uh, change your display on your uh, on your screen to indicate your first and last name, so we know who we're talking to. Um, Anyone who wishes to address the council, either in person or remotely, must be recognized by the chair. And we um, and we ask you to limit your comments at any point in the meeting to three minutes. And our uh, communications director will assist us with uh, with timekeeping. And uh, we ask everyone, when you're addressing the council, to keep your comments and questions germane to the uh, subject uh, under discussion. Um, with that, I would ask if we have, uh, if we're ready to approve the agenda, does uh, anyone have any changes they want to make to the agenda? Tim. I'd just like to pull a couple items off the consent agenda. Sure. Why don't we do that when we get to the consent okay. agenda? Okay. Otherwise, the agenda is fine. Okay. I'll consider the agenda approved. And next item on the agenda is general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is not on tonight's agenda. I'll uh, take comments from people in the room and also people online. And, and again, we ask you to limit your comments to three minutes in length. Um, is there anyone in the room who'd like to be recognized? Yes, sir. Thanks, Tim. Why don't you step up to the microphone, please, so that your voice goes out to the public. How are you doing? Uh, right now, my name is Taylor Mayor Brown. Uh, right now, I currently live in Montpelier, shifting off another way. I'm one of the homeless vets. I've been coming in this situation dealing with uh, identity theft. That's why I'm on the street. Currently, I'm being complained or had a complaint hit me about my campsite that was approved by Legion. But approved by county judge and approved by Montpelier while I'm waiting to ship back into my apartment on down street waiting list. First thing this morning, I got woken up, affecting my whole day to while I'm before you now with complaints from the citizens of Montpelier where I'm camping at, even though it's worked out. So I'm here to understand where we can prepare things to be done. I'm supposed to be out of that situation the next couple of weeks. That's why I'm here, Honor. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else in the room here? Yes, come on up. Hello, my name is Aiden Ballantyne, and I'm here as a concerned community member. I recently learned that the city of Montpelier and cops showed up at the Old Elks Club and walked through people's homes, also known as tents. This action caused folks who were living there to flee. My question to the city council is, on camera on August 14th, 2024, 40 minutes and 38 seconds in response from a good Sam worker who asked if they don't want to go anywhere, what are we supposed to do? The city council's response was, this is not an anti-camping thing. How are we as a community supposed to believe you have the best interest of this community when cops show up. I want to remind everyone here that anybody can become homeless at any given time. We as a community have to do better. We need to include folks in community gatherings and focus more on food drops rather than calling the city council or cops for the sake of comfort of others. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in the room? Steve. Uh, Steve Whitaker, I have just 
gotten first sight of the use policy that is attempting to be. Uh, and my first take on it without careful study is that it's totally contradictory to what was discussed at the August 14th meeting, which I've circulated a transcript of. Um, so, so I know this I, is on the agenda, so you could save your time for okay. other items. Um, the I just got a copy of the headline article uh, referenced uh, EPA grant, which proposes expanding the district heat. But when I looked at the uh, document this afternoon, it appears to grant virtually all of the remaining capacity to downstreet housing uh, for the Elm Street. And I believe that's not proper process to consider other potential developments in town that might want to utilize some of that capacity. I understood that the financial model, the capacity and rate model was being reworked to make it more attractive to get more customers on. Uh, that will be moot if all of the remaining or almost all the remaining capacity is granted to downstreet for the Elm Street properties. So I believe there needs to be a, a more transparent and uh, a broader discussion around potential uses because I know uh, Trinity Methodist Church has been considering and waiting for that revised model, financial model, but yet I see no evidence of it in the contract or in the deliverables from the contractor, Evergreen, I believe it is. So Evergreen has not worked on a financial model, has not been asked to work on a financial model other than to review, you know, half a dozen complainers whose data had gaps in it. So I just think this is uh, all too typical of the way more oversight, more eyes, more transparency needs to be on this. Uh, I'm not averse to accepting EPA money, but I am averse to committing all of the remaining heat plant capacity to the downstreet Elm Street apartments. Um, I'm going to speak briefly about the school street. Uh, again, valves that won't operate, valves that are not uh, readily identifiable have delayed that project. By and Monday was virtually a whole wasted day of in, and my rough calculation after consulting some experts is a day with that many men and that much equipment costs about 20 grand. Of course, it's to be negotiated, but uh, they're not going to take it lightly that we can't move our valves because we haven't exercised them. So this is part of strangling and short staffing the public works department for decades and potentially causing valves to seize, which then cost $20,000 or more. Thanks, Steve. I hope you'll Sorry. ask to discuss this topic more because it merits your full attention. Anybody else in the room who's not spoken? Hi, Hi. Uh, my name is Azula, pronoun under she, her. Um, I just wanted to comment about the treatment of unhoused folks that were living at the Elks Lodge encampment. Um, we have a topic about the policy at the uh, Country Club Road property, so. Sounds good. You may want to hold your comment then, but. Yeah, I mean, I just want to say uh, shame. Okay. Shame on the way I'll handle this. Anybody else in the room? Okay, looking online, I see, I just want to, Dr. O. Thank you very much. I'm going to stay off camera because I have issues with conductivity, but I have a broader issue than the uh, unhoused people. I'm a concerned citizen and a resident of Montpelier and a gardener up at the Page Bailey Memorial BIPOC Garden, and I've witnessed all this drama up on that 130 acres over the last few weeks. And I wanna say that there are differences with respect to treatment by rank and privilege of various stakeholders. Uh, there's gardeners like me, there's farmers, um, there's that are mentoring the youth conservation core people and providing healthy eating to seniors. There's dog walkers, there's kids playing sports and there were about a dozen people living rough as the British would say. So I saw interventions by the city that were um, supposedly to keep me safe. And I wanna say that I go up there every day to weed 
and the group that is most dangerous to me right now are the dog walkers. I'm not asking you to do anything about the dog walkers. I'm just asking you to leave the people who have nowhere else to live alone and possibly open up the bathrooms up there because bringing them food is great, but people are having to bring water up there. And again, somebody else mentioned a word that says that I'm not proud of what my city is doing. I sent a letter to all of the council members that is a little more detailed and I pass. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm not, not seeing anyone else online with their hand raised. Do you have me, Jack? I thought I raised okay. my hand. Okay, thanks, Zach. And uh, I, I, uh, I'd like to comment now because I don't feel good, so I won't be staying on uh, very long. I, I think, um, I just, um, I think that it's a continuing thing that we need to continue to push toward. Uh, I'm Zach Hughes. I'm uh, over in um, in District Three. Sorry, um, and I um, am a concerned citizen, and I I come here tonight um, out of concern about the uh, the situation around uh, camping in the city. And I appreciate those who come out to talk with y'all because I've encouraged them to show up at meetings because um, I think it's important. We, and we had a very powerful homelessness task force special meeting today, um, and uh, but I I um, I have to say I'm concerned that I continue to be concerned. I don't know if the state is going to come through for us. I believe that at some point we're going to have to do the city's going to have to do more. I don't know what that's going to look like, uh, and I remain um, very concerned about. Uh, this and uh, I think this comes down to perception. And it's really important. I say this to bodies all the time. I say, listen, it's perception. So the perception might be that we're doing, you know, these are like the there's sweeps going on, you know, even though the idea is we're saying, well, it's for safety, but there, you know, and there is information that we don't all have. And yeah, you know, sometimes. Uh, all that, but I just want to be very clear that uh, perception is one of the things that can lead to this, uh, you know, these issues. And um, and I do appreciate uh, um, that y'all want to do something. I just uh, hope that we can continue to work together. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. I do not see anybody else. So we'll move to the consent agenda. I see there are a couple of items we've been asked to take off the consent agenda. One is item H, the uh, composition of the housing committee. And there's another one, Tim. I'd like to take off B for the payroll and warrant approval. Um, also, I'm just curious about some detail on D on Wyndham Drive uh, okay. boardwalk, and I didn't see anything in the package. Oh. Okay, so we'll take B, D, and H off and the I, the oh. GMP fast charger piece for 12 and 16 May. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Okay, I, the chair would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of items B, D, H, and I. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor signify by saying, oh, sorry, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we've adopted the consent agenda with the exception of those items. Um, Tim. Just perils and work, just as a an item to point out, um, is we're not too far from budget process and that's, so so within that, I uh, kind of went through, there are roughly 37 items. I assume this is the annual giving that we do, the charitable oh, piece. Yeah, so, I mean, so there's 37 items, basically, uh, most of them total about 107000 and then you've got the $222,000 payment for the library. So we've got about 329000 in this group of warrants for charitable giving, um, which I'm certainly not against, but it may be, as we look at tight budgets, it, I don't know if there's another way to do it or 
you know, I know the community is generous and donates to these groups as well. Um, I just think it's something we're going to have to consider because the numbers are clearly really tight uh, that are coming at us. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, that's all. All right. And, and is there any further discussion of that item? Is there a motion to approve item B? Payroll and warrants. Move it, I'll second it. Okay. So moved. Second. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Very good. Uh, next, uh, bid approval for the boardwalk at Wyndham Drive. I had to look up where Wyndham Drive was. So uh, well, I know because it was my driveway and I created it. So ah, I was okay. to know how this, what is this? Yeah. Uh, Kurt, do you know, are you the first person, the person to talk about this? Yeah. I think it is actually parks. It's the connection oh, okay. from this property to parks. So it'll be Alec. I don't, I'm not that familiar with some. So we can hold it. I, I really don't have the information. I don't want to make something up. I think it's parks, but I'm not sure. Um, what's your pleasure? Um, I, I a couple questions. One is there a sketch showing this to know what it's going to be, and two, um, hopefully the neighbors have been consulted, consulted and support this. Um, can let you me see, uh, see if I can get a hold of Alec. And okay. Go on. Okay. Let's, let's get him. Come on. Let's, get let's let's pass that for now. Um, item H is the housing committee member seat reduction. Um, Josh, are you up for that? And Rebecca. Okay, come on up. Rebecca Kilbans, co-chair of the Housing Committee. Uh, Josh Brown, Community and Economic Development Specialist. Um, so we have had a challenge getting a quorum for the Housing Committee since I think June it was the last time we've had a quorum. Um, we currently, um, we have, I believe nine members and two city councilors, or is it 11? Uh, total seats are 12. 12. Um, we would like to reduce it to seven Nine. plus two, right? Yeah. So seven members plus our two city councilors. Um, we have, I'm hoping that down the agenda, we have an application for a new member and I'm hoping you'll approve her when, when that comes up. Um, but we're really struggling to just hold a vote. <laughs> We've had uh, three special meetings to try to get enough of a quorum to to hold a vote um, on the housing trust fund, we haven't been able to get a quorum, so it's it's really a struggle. How many people do you usually wind up getting to the meetings? Uh, well, we haven't had a quorum since June. Yeah, before so that, five we had, or six. Yeah, and before that, it was you know basically at quorum, if maybe one extra. Um, but then we lost a few, um, just from the normal. Um, term ending and then we lost one a couple maybe a week ago um just because life gets busy um so we're just <laughs> yeah the other thing is is that the preference uh for meetings has been to have a hybrid uh format uh to allow members the ease of participating in the public and because of such a large group we're limited in the space uh, and the technology Right, the senior center has been the in-person um, space, but they don't, their technology for hybrid is not really set up for smooth meetings. So, by reducing the number, we've had a sort of a conversation to be like we could agree that we could use a manager's conference room, and only half of the members would be in person; the other half would be online. So, it, and that is a better technology situation over there. So it'll allow for a smoother uh, hybrid meeting. That's the other reason. Yeah, the uh, month or two ago, and we had that uh, that meeting with the presentations from people talking about uh, housing development at the senior center. I suspect that the people watching from home didn't get much out of it because uh, it seemed like the mics weren't weren't picking people up, and it really was not that good. Yeah, it would be phenomenal if um, city committees had 
some more mobile technology, just a microphone that plugs into a computer. I mean, I brought one the last meeting, um, but we didn't have a quorum. So we, it, it's really, the technology is a real struggle. The space has been a real struggle um, just to find a space that will allow us to, to meet. I mean, I would be happy to meet in the hallway, <laughs> honestly, like it's, it's really gotten really challenging and it's frustrating as a volunteer committee to be dealing with such um, mundane issues like technology and just getting enough people to show up for a vote. Yeah. A while back, I remember we, we talked about uh, maybe the city should acquire one of those uh, owl micro conference microphone camera setups. They're, they're kind of expensive. But uh, we have one in my office, and it seems to work really very well. I mean, even just a um, if there's a phone available, I mean, just a, a bat phone, for the lack of a better term, mm -hmm. um, to allow people to call in. I mean, just some there's there's there are definitely answers to the technology problem. Um, they just need to be addressed, addressed, and solved. Okay. Um, members of the council have any uh, thoughts on this? Tim, you're on the housing committee, right? What What's your sense of how things have been going? I agree. It's been difficult to get the numbers of folks at every meeting. Um, we had, what, six at the last meeting, but we needed seven for a quorum, and that was as close as we got. Yeah. And we were begging. I <laughs> was calling people, emailing. We could not get a last person to shop. So the, the total number of people on the committee right now is... Seven is 12? 12 seats. So the request would be to reduce that to nine. Okay. Uh huh. Um, anybody, anyone else on the council have any, any thoughts or comments? Um, I do. Okay. So my question is, and, I, and I, I know this has come up before, but it's about how we define a quorum. Do we have it? actually written down anywhere, whether a quorum is a majority of the seats on the committee or whether it's a majority of the members of the committee? Generally under state statute, it's for municipalities, it's a majority of the body. So, so the number, uh, so, so if there are vacancies, they're not, those seats are not right. counted. So. Well, is that right? Is that what that means? Because that, that's how I interpret it in my in my state job situation where we have to determine a quorum, but we did, sometimes the legislature will clearly specify one or the other. So we should be clear about how we operate. Because if it's a, if a quorum is only a majority of the current members, then that might make things a little bit easier. I mean, I'm, I think this is a good idea to change the composition of this committee, but just as a broader question, we shouldn't be struggling with quorum because we don't have enough members of the committee at all. We'll get more clarity on that, but we've certainly always functioned that it was ma majority of the body, um, but we can check on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Steve. Uh, Steve Whitaker. Uh, I would caution and ask that this not be a, a snap decision. I, I understand that I was at the last meeting um, which uh, necessitated looking over the shoulder of another member in order to, I don't think it's adequate to just spin a laptop. I think that meetings need to have full engagement. People need to see who's speaking uh, because everyone doesn't announce when they're speaking. And so I've been arguing that for a while, but on a broader perspective, I believe the housing committee has so much important work to do. You may recall, or some of you may recall, a year or two ago, I recommended that the housing committee take on the emergency housing issue because the ho homelessness task force is absolutely dysfunctional and has not accomplished a single thing they set out to do five years ago when I persuaded the council to create that council, that task force. So five years later, they've still not accomplished task one and the importance has only gotten greater. So we have emergency housing and we have country club road housing and we've got downtown infill and ADUs to deal with. I believe I asked Rebecca this evening, how, how have you gone about recruiting to try to get some other interest groups 
possibly from the unhoused committee, possibly from the ADU expertise or, you know, but there's so much work to do with regard to the Elks Club, defining what types of housing and how much of what types might go there that I don't believe it's smart to shrink this committee down to uh, an unrepresentative. Um, if you go to nine, two of them are city councils. I don't believe Josh uh, votes. Um, right, he's staff. Yeah, I, I just think that that, I would encourage you consider keeping it the way it is and, and expanding its duties to take over what the homelessness task force has been incapable of doing, which is to wrestle with. Now, recall that on August 14th, when you had that poignant hearing dedicated to the Elks Club issues, it was right. It was stated that you were going to charge the homelessness task force to work with the housing committee and come back in 30 days. Well, those 30 days came and went and no one was charged with anything and but you get the point that this this is there's an emergency going on and there's a whole lot of work to do from various price points and various uh points of view about the nature of how our second uh neighborhood is going to evolve and i would be concerned that it gets too small and uh inbred <laughs> thanks steve Yes, sir. I actually disagree with it. Hey, hey, you spit, tell, tell us your name again. I'm Taylor Brett Brown, Your Honor. I'm actually shifting into Vermont. I have inheritance on Mount Stratton. That's why I'm here in the capital city. I'm going farmer. I'm actually it's legitly ID that through VA. I'm H540 out of Sikorsky Aircraft UA. I'm first small. I turn ridge KC-130 aircraft. I know how to do a project. They're right to reduce putting more people where your situation being one of the homeless, because I don't care. It's just camp and I'm right now fun. You just need somebody who can literally put a list together. What's going on. Cause you're dealing with not Mount Pillar. You're dealing with Washington County. That's where I'm looking at y'all people like y'all silly. You're dealing with every homeless individual that's been slammed right now with the last two floods in the last year mm -hmm. off the rip. You've got projects being left, knocked down left to right. Not only in Mount period, but you realize you're dealing with Barry as well. Right. Your honor. Real talk. Capstone and Downstreet are the only ones who are actually allowing anybody shift in. The rules they have right now for homeless, they're throwing credit scores at you. They're throwing you need address at you. They're throwing all this stuff at you, but they're not giving you a way to develop. The housing committee knows all this information. We are not at more eyes need to see. You at you need bodies to just take information to Excel sheets. It's a real approach. I've seen it. I'm in your process. It's just, you need freaking foots. You don't need more heads. This chief thought is done. I agree with what they're saying, where they're see where it's at seven bodies. I bet you have more attendance just because you have more information coming up. It sounds like that's what your, the issue is ending for. Why are we showing up the information for the meeting every time? And I know it's true. You have literally funds going up and down, and, ain't, and it's coming down. It ain't the city's fault. It's coming. This is federal triangle at the end. There's a lot of finished stamps that ain't supported, and it has to do with what's going on in the election. Big talk. Coming down a little talk with FEMA support coming from last year that's still kicking in what you're talking about with the EPA. That's FEMA support on the finish on that. And then we're still coming out the flood that just banged Barry and St. John's, and that all comes in. You gotta realize how that transit center brings them into the capital city so we can get them housed. That's how this homeless system is working. Real talk. You're off the transit center, you're off Mount Pillar, and you're off of Capstone and Downstreet of actually trying to shift people out. That's your information center being in with your whole homeless, all the way down to what happened at Elks Ridge, but you're, or Elks Lodge, I'm sorry. But you're talking about, you have a system that's saying, step up, like you're perfect coming out with a perfect freaking credit score. You have a freaking address and a cell phone to get an apartment. No issues. And they're kicking people out of the program because they can't come up with the information. I'm done, Your Honor. That's my experience. Thank you. Um, Adrian, and then Palin. Um, yes, thank you. So... I'm just thinking that, you know, I mean, running volunteer committees is really hard and and thinking about the quality versus the quantity is really important. And so, you know, making sure that if you do reduce the number to nine um, and having been very clear, I don't know if your committee does this, but having certain roles that you recruit to fill rather than number of seats, it's kind of a different way of looking at it so that you ensure that your committee is diverse, your your you know, who is sitting on that committee that is representative of our community rather than trying to reach number 12. 
right? So, you know, if you do drop it down to nine, um, you know, making sure those nine folks are representative of our community um, rather than just a number of 12, which I don't know, that seems like an arbitrary number. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, Palin? Yeah, if you don't have any specific rule about the number of the members for each committee, and if the committee members think that it will create better job, uh, I think we should trust their experience. So if they if their need is to reduce the number, then it should be that way. Thank you. Rebecca. Uh, when we created the when we went to 12, it was because those were the, you know, the applicants that came to us that were really compelling and um that we felt like would would serve the committee well. Um People are not knocking down our door to join the housing committee. We have a, you know, there's people really busy. It's and it's a frankly a pain in the neck to show up at a volunteer meeting every month. It's hard. It's people are, you know, they have they have jobs, they have kids, they have grandkids. Um, so the reason that we the number isn't is is both both arbitrary and somewhat not arbitrary. It's just who shows up um and applies. Yeah, Tim. Yeah, following our talk the other night too, it, if if there is clarification that it's a majority of the number of assigned committee members, if we have like four vacancies like right now, if those don't count, then we could meet a quorum and be okay. If that clarification can be made, and two, I think we talked about if it's reduced, we could also have alternate members. So if people want to participate, we'll certainly. I mean, they'd have the opportunity to to be involved. Yeah, I and I feel pretty strongly. I would well, I would want to look it up, but I feel pretty strongly that the quorum is the number of the majority of the number of people who are actually on the committee. So vacancies don't count towards don't don't kill the quorum. But I think, uh, but I would I would want to look it up to be sure. That'd be great mm -hmm. to have. Bill, are you say something? Okay, we'll get about yeah. So I'm going to suggest we look at that, get get a clear answer, and then maybe take it up at the next meeting. Okay, thanks Thank for you. coming in. Appreciate it. Thanks for your work. I I know, and I've in other contexts I've done the same thing, calling around to people, making sure that people would be here, and then it's it's not fun for the people who've made it every time. And. <laughs> Okay. And Alec Thanks. is now online um, to talk about the Wyndham Drive. Okay, Alec. Going back to item D, bid approval for boardwalk at Wyndham Drive. Yes, hi, everybody. Um, so let's see, can I answer any specific questions or do you want me to just uh, go over the whole thing? Why don't you give us an overview? Sure, yeah. So this is part of... Um, uh, the Hubbard Park expansion project going back several years, um, the city um, purchased Wyndham Drive, uh, which is a formerly private drive gravel road, um, along with the 78 acres, which uh, was a combination of two parcels. And there's a vast informal trail network on that, um, those parcels. And when we did that project, one of the big um, interests in the, you know, among the community for adding that land to the park was providing better neighborhood access for the Park West neighborhood. And so uh, we explored a number of options and um, the one from Wyndham Drive was um, the most feasible uh, one. And so we need to cross a stream in order to access the main trail network. Um, and this boardwalk is required to cross that stream from Wyndham Drive. And uh... Is that simply a pedestrian and and bicycle um, way? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and Tim had a question about whether you uh, talk to the neighbors about this. Yes. Yes. The neighbors are aware. There are folks who live at the top of Wyndham Drive, and they hold a access easement in order to uh, access their house. And they have been they've been informed since day one and every step along the way so how okay. far up the drive do you go before you take the footbridge across 
Um, I can share a map if that's helpful. Um, listen, yeah, let me, let me. can yeah, I share my great. screen? You, you're getting the nod, so you should be able to do it. Ah, here we go. All right, so this is a big picture map. Uh, Wyndham Drive is down here in the bottom uh, left corner, and this is this part of the bigger bigger picture trail network. These blue trails here are the uh, existing informal trails in the Hubbard Park expansion area. This orange one is a multi-use connector trail that we're planning between the pool and Wyndham and this Park West neighborhood. Uh, and then the red trails are the existing trails in Hubbard Park. So that probably bigger picture than we need for tonight. <laughs> um, but can you can you see the tabs as I scroll through? Now can you see a smaller? Yeah. Okay. Great. Yep. Um, so uh, let's let me scroll down here to a larger map. So yeah, this is Clarendon Avenue right here. Um, this is Wyndham Drive. This is the house, basically where this pavement. Uh, ends is where the property line is and the boardwalk is right here. So come up the drive and go across the stream right here. Um, this is the site plan. Uh, and the boardwalk is 60 feet long. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you have any other questions, Tim? I guess just a, th a couple of thoughts. So, I mean, this is a drive to somebody's home and um, it just, it, I would go up, I mean, you're going up pretty far up. Is there a way to go up a, a little less far and cut across just in terms of being fair to people? Um, and the other question I have is just about maintenance of the driveway. It's been someone's driveway and they've taken care of it for years because they're the only ones who used it. But if it's now a public way, does the city end up having some responsibility to maintain it? Yeah, so um, about as far as how far we go up the driveway, we went only as far as we needed to to get past the parcel that is on Clarendon Ave. So we're going at the lowest possible point. Um, I would okay. say it is it is an improvement over the alternative, which was to go right up the stream, right by their house, um, which the city owns all of that land and and you know and in, in they've been involved you know in a lot of conversations since uh, before the project. Uh, before the city bought the land and you know this was uh something that they were fine with um and it seemed like a good good option good way to go um and then the second question about um yeah city maintenance of the driveway uh we have uh also discussed that with the landowner they're fine maintaining the plowing of the driveway mm -hmm. we have added material and regraded it um once already since the city owned it which is a, a fairly routine thing for us to do um, I have informed them that we're we're open to plowing it, um, you know, up to their paved uh, private property. You know, we're open to plowing the city portion of it, certainly, um, but it doesn't make a whole ton of sense when they have somebody driving in to plow their 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 lot anyways. Um, and you know, that person would have to pass over literally the same ground that the city plow would have to pass over. So, our our current stance is we're we're happy to plow it if if they would like, but it doesn't logistically make a lot of sense. Okay, um, uh, Sal. I'm just wondering if you anticipate this increasing um, traffic or parking on Clarendon uh, in the vicinity of the uh, access. Yeah, so that's been a question that we have been, we've addressed since the project began. Um, obviously, folks don't want to see more people parking in front of their house, and our position on this project has been always that this is a neighborhood access, and so if, now, like, if you could. Alec, if you could keep your voice a little higher, that would be helpful, I think. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, is this better? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, our position has been that if, if people are in cars, we want them driving into the park because there's plenty of parking inside Hubbard Park. Um, and if people live in the neighborhood, this is a neighborhood access for them. So it's similar to other neighborhood accesses we have to our parks around the city, like North Park Drive. Um and other places. So uh, not hoping to have any increased uh, parking traffic along the road for this access point. It's supposed to be for 
walkers and and bikers and people accessing it from the neighborhood. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Steve, do you have something to say about this? I just, uh, I just the fact that no map, I I can't see well. I can't hear most of what Alex said, and it just wasn't pre presented with all the documentation in the packet. So, it is the easement a permanent easement that travels to the next owner? The city owns the property. No, yeah, no, the, the city easement, owns the property, oh, yeah. and the easement on the house would yeah. travel. Yes, the easement yeah. is a, is recorded in the deed for the uh, pro private property that we're crossing. Mm -hmm. But again, process wise, this should the maps and the schematic drawings and stuff should have been in the packet. And I, I I think it's the other way around, Steve. I think it's I think the homeowner has an easement across property that the city owns. So it's not that the city has, has okay, an easement. So the homeowner across crosses property. city land to get to their house. Right. And okay. they have a permanent easement that runs with the land for that. All right. So there's no risk of us losing this access in the future. Correct. All right. Thanks. Okay, folks, is there a motion to approve the uh, the bid? Is that a motion? Yeah. So moved. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, and then, now the GMP DC fast chargers. Same question, no maps. Where is it going to be? Because <laughs> we're trying to sell a lot over there. Um, and my fear was we're putting it on the lot we're trying to sell, which already has a lot of complicating factors. So it's actually, they're going to be in the parking lot behind that lot, okay. which is not initially what's up for sale. Right. We realize we may end up having to negotiate about the use of that lot, but it'll only be taking up two parking spaces in. It's two, they'll be creating two charging spaces. Right okay. To, yeah. On parking spaces. It's that address, but it's different lot. It's not on the 7,800 square feet per cell. So, <laughs> That's good. the question. Good question. Very good. Okay. Um, is there a motion to approve that? Okay. I recommended, uh, again, a year or two ago that we consider our, our bridges as more convenient downtown location because we can wire them from the bottom. And I've seen nothing about a public process for deciding where these chargers should be. And I know that that lot has problems, the trucks that tr come in there and get stuck trying to deliver to Avishans because the turning radius wasn't designed. That whole backside of that lot has to be removed. The parking kiosk is has shifted and tilted. It's it's not a good, it's not a well thought out uh, location when considering all the other options in town for where electricity is available. Are these three phase? Do these require three phase power? You don't know? Uh, I don't think so, because we're putting some in in a place where I don't have three phase. Are these level three or level two? No. These are DC fast chargers. That's level two. I mean, I, I think we need a plan, especially that VTrans has got millions uh, for this. I think we need a plan for where our chargers should be distributed around town, similar to public restrooms. Imagine that. Thanks, Steve. Is there a motion to approve the DC fast charger agreement? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Thanks. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. We are done with the consent agenda on to our next item, which is an appointment to the design review committee. And we have uh, an application from uh, Rebecca Owens. Oh, let's just mention we have a couple of appointments, Rebecca Owens to the design review committee and Harry San to the housing committee. Are either of those people here who are participating uh, Remotely, I'm not seeing the names, but I'm scroll scrolling through. Mm 
Is there a motion? We do a motion for both. Yeah. Okay. Can do one for both. So Rebecca Owens is a reappointment, correct? Yeah. So move to reappoint Re Rebecca Owens to the Design Review Committee and to appoint Harry Son to the Housing Committee. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Okay. That gets us to item number eight, the responsible contractor policy. Okay, we could, we've got a big, uh, big crowd here. Let's skip to item 10, Country Club Road use policy. Um, is that you or Kelly? It's Kelly, but I'm going to quickly start while she's getting Okay. Um, so the history of this, some may remember uh, last year after the flood, uh, there was a, a request to have um, a concert at Country Club Road, and we, there were a lot of logistic issues. We ended up having it on the State House lawn, which worked out fine. Um, but I think at that time we said, we collectively said that really isn't something we ought to be doing there. It's not really set up for those kind of things. And we said we should have a policy for the types of things that are and are not used. And we began working on that, but obviously we had flood cleanup, we had budget, and then for a while FEMA was going to go in and um, put housing there. So we sort of stopped working on it. We got through budget, and for various reasons, this has never been at the top of the list. So this is really finally coming in with uh, CCR use policy. It isn't particularly driven by current circumstances. So we've always, uh, you know, we have a no camping policy in all of our parks area so that was included but i just want to be clear this wasn't in a specific response to um this situation but obviously it is pertinent given what's going on so understand there'll be discussion about that but kelly did the lion's share of the work so i'll have her walk through it and we'll take it from there okay, uh, everyone. Thank you. working on it steve thank you um, Kelly Murphy, Assistant City Manager, uh, getting the microphone set up here. And then I'm going to go ahead and um, just share um, the screen here so that I can kind of uh, show the policy um, that's in draft form is also available on the website. I think everybody can see that, correct? Great. Okay. So essentially, uh, Bill just teed this up and went over sort of the history of what has prompted uh, this use policy. Um, this is something that we've been, you know, thinking about for quite some time. Um, we had intended to bring it forward earlier than this, but just, you know, the course of events have prevented us from doing so. And so um, looking at uh, just the permitted uses, um, these are permitted uses that have been generated based on current use at the facility. And so just walking through them quickly, um, we've got uh, passive recreation, such as hiking, walking, jogging, adult and youth sports, community gardens, educational programming, picnicking and gathering, hunting and fishing as permitted uh, with state uh, licenses, um, and then limited events as reviewed by staff for public safety requirements and approved by council, um, and then general maintenance of the property. Um, and so just in a general sense, those are the items that would be permitted if this were approved. Um, and then moving on to prohibited uses um, would be things such as motorized use of vehicles with the exception of maintenance vehicles or city personnel vehicles, emergency services and the like, overnight camping, um, it's not permitted, altering the landscape in any way, disruptive activities, and then um, firearms and deadly weapons. Um, and then additional guidance, uh, just looking on further here, um, some of the things that we wanted to highlight um, based on you know, where we are with other entities within the city, such as parks and recreation, is um, that no person shall be or remain on the property from the hours of 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. or dusk to dawn. Um, and then uh, it goes on to further identify public access, just pet policy, um, waste management, alcohol and drugs, and then fire safety. Um, and so this would be um, enforced based on what's in the policy um, and, you know, looking at any violations that may occur um, with existing staff. So that's um, the policy review here. I'm happy to take up any of the items for discussion um, and I'll just leave it there.
Kelly. And just to reiterate what Kelly said, um, this is really based on comparable policies in other areas of the city, um, but it's our draft to propose. So obviously you, the council can do as you see fit or change it as you see fit. Um, it's a policy, it's not an ordinance at this point, actually it made me wonder if we can actually issue fines. I'm not sure, just caught that. Um, but we could amend that, but otherwise, yeah, I think it's for your discussion. Thanks. Um, Kelly, one of the things that uh, occurred to me on the uh, prohibited uses, the thing, uh, motorized vehicles, um, it seems to be cover the entire parcel. Um, we might want to clarify that it doesn't apply to the paved areas. We can do that. Thank you. Or maintenance vehicles, right? Yeah. Well, it does say, ex except for authorized city personnel maintenance or emergency purposes, yeah. But obviously, we want people to be able to use the parking lots. Your lot, yeah. Council members, any? Uh, oh, Carrie. Thanks. Um, so I did kind of compare this side by side with the Hubbard Park rules. And um, so I could see that that's kind of where they came from. And they really do mirror the Hubbard Park rules with a couple of things that are different. I mean, one is the specification of hunting being allowed at some at times, which I think is good because that is something we discussed as wanting to allow it to happen up there. Um, the other thing that is different, or one of the things different is the um, uh, banning alcohol up there. Alcohol is allowed in Hubbard Park. And I wondered what the rationale was for not for prohibiting it here when it's allowed in um, Hubbard Park. Um, you know, I think uh, some of the the items that, you know, for their prohibitive uses have come from experience on the property. Um, and so we have had some instances where there has been, you know, open use at that facility that's not permitted and unfortunately has led to some, you know, behaviors that, you know, are not ideal. Um, and so if council were wanting that to mirror what is allowed at Hubbard Park, we certainly could amend that. Um, we were uh, bringing it forward just in terms of, you know, what we're seeing at that property and what we have for current use. Um, so we, we could certainly be consistent. And are you, are you set, Carrie, for the moment? Okay, thanks. Uh, Adrian, and then uh, Sal? Yeah, just a quick clarifying question. So just someone remind me, um, with the shelter being on this property, um, how does that impact the additional guidelines of no person shall be or remain on the property between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m.? So is that conflicting? Does that not, you know, matter what the what the shelter rules and regulations? Just want some clarity on that. I mean, I think that the, the intent for, you know, sort of the general um, no person shall remain on the property, and we could probably have an accept clause in here, um, is that, you know, at large on the property, um, this wouldn't necessarily be um, indicative of the shelter. And so the shelter does have a policy that, you know, folks that are at the shelter would remain in the shelter, but they cannot be outside of the premises. And so I, I would consider that to be consistent, but um, we could certainly clarify just to make sure that it is, you know, fully consistent with the, the shelter rules. Thanks. Uh, Sal? Uh, I was just curious about the um, the hunting policy at, we, we permit hunting and fishing, um, but we prohibit firearms. Uh, could you just talk about that? Sure. Yeah, so um, when we were drafting this policy, that is something that we did discuss internally as staff. Um, and so, we would, you know, sort of allow for, you know, um, the use of um, hunting implements. So that may mean, you know, firearms or car compound bows, but they're for a specific purpose. Whereas, you know, a standalone firearm would not be a permitted use on the property. 
Um, so you would need to have an accompanying hunting or fishing license. We could clarify that to say, you know, firearms only permitted except, you know, during hunting season, during hunting hours, but, you know, something making it clear that only for those purposes. In the possession of persons engaged in hunting Correct. as per their license. Yep. Uh, Adrian. Um, well, and thank you, Carrie, for doing that research. I would have done it if I wasn't sick today. Um, and so I just, so in kind of what Carrie said and thinking about our overarching policy around our public space in the city of Montpelier in regards to camping and overnight stays, that is consistent. Um, and we obviously know there's been people camping up at this um, location. And so, and just kind of thinking about our other policy um, that we've been talking about in terms of the homeless assist task force and what they're working on. And I just, I'm just trying, I feel like there's like a gap here of like, what is the plan? What is the plan? Um, so we have this policy, it's consistent with our, um, you know, city policy and our recre and our public land. But I would, I really would love to see what is the plan from the homeless and task force. If we're going to continue to implement these policies of no camping overnight, it's not permitted. Um, so what is the plan for the folks that are camping at this facility? And what does that look like? Um, well, that's a pretty big question uh, and goes well beyond just the, the city in terms of the capacity. As we've talked about, there's really no legal place for anybody to be. Uh, and there's inadequate shelter, in, inadequate housing. Uh, and I've recently met with uh, town and city officials from all over the state and everyone has the exact same situation as us. Uh, the fact is, you know, we have also have people camping in Harvard Park and we check on them. Uh, we are, you know, we are trying to keep things safe and as clean as possible and address behaviors as, as much as possible. Uh, we do, we are trying to get this site vacated in time for the shelter. Uh, that's been our goal here. Uh, we have not yet issued any you no know, trespass orders or anything like that. Uh, we've been trying to work with people. And, um, you know, uh, sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. But is it, you know, I think the other side of that coin is if we issue a blanket uh, permission, we don't have, you know, then we don't have the means to manage the site at all. And we don't have uh, the wherewithal to sort of provide the services, the management, the oversight, the safety services that would probably be necessary by the amount of people um, that could take advantage of that. So that, that's kind of the pro and con. There's no, there, there's, there's only bad answers to that question. Tim or Palin, do you have anything at this point? Is the shelter scheduled to open? October 1st. October 1st. So 19 days. So at this point, 20 days. Okay, I'll take, uh, oh, Sal. Uh, I'm just curious about the, I, I think the, uh, um, I, I haven't been up to country club recently, but I think the encampment is uh, more or less no, no longer there. And I, I think our policy requires us to um, store abandoned materials for a certain period of time. I, I could be wrong. I'm just curious if that is in fact the case. And are, are we are we doing that? Did we did we find materials that that we need to store? And how are we managing that? So um, we actually um, there are still uh, encampments at Country Club Road, um, we have been monitoring them um, in terms of um, their activity to see if there's anybody still at those sites. Um, in a couple of the instances, there are not. Um, we have been working with Good Samaritan Haven to provide notice and just get confirmation on the status of those sites. One of the sites in particular, um, and related to your question, Sal, is um, in pretty rough shape. Um, it is, there, there are some pretty significant public health and safety concerns and that there is, you know, trash throughout the location. 
Um, uh, there are, you know, it's there, there are other things too, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, and so that one, you know, we are, are working on, you know, coming up with a plan for actively cleaning up those locations. Um, and so when a tent can be saved, we work with Good Samaritan Haven or our partners to save those tents and we will store them if we can. And instances where the tents are beyond repair or they are in rough shape because of just, you know, the elements or, you know, trash and the like, you know, we would dispose of those tents because they're just, we, we can't really store them um, because of their condition. And so we usually make that call on cleanup. And so that's where we're at currently um, with those those sites. So I'm, I'm assuming that um, campers who have left the property have taken the, the papers, the ID, you know the the kind of stuff that that they need on the day to day. They've taken that stuff with them. And if we do we do we find any of that stuff? And what do we do with it when we do? I'm not aware that we find personal identification papers. Mm -hmm. um, and in these particular instances, we have been working pretty diligently to reach out to folks staying at those sites to make sure that they are aware of you know sort of the policy and what we're working on in terms of getting those sites cleaned up. Um, and so, you know, I'm not aware of any, um, personally identifying information or, you know, belongings that, you know, folks would, would need of that nature. Um, but certainly if we did come across something like that, we would hold it. Um, but for instances where, you know, they are in such a state that, you know, we, we can't keep them. And is, and is it mostly tents or are you finding other personal property that you think, uh, might be something that people want to have stored? Um, it's mostly tents, um, you know, and there, you know, could be maybe, well, it's mostly tents. I mean, there are other items that are up there, right? You know, but they're not necessarily, it's not like they've got somebody's name on them. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll take comments from the public. Steve? Yeah, I, I think this is a bigger issue than you can fit possibly into three minutes, especially how uh, this has been. This seems like a superb manipulation to outlaw the homeless, and it and it's strategic, and it's it's not even thinly veiled. And the the need for emergency housing, and the admission from Good Samaritan that they can't meet our needs to pretend that these folks are all going to fit in the shelter uh, at Good Samaritan is is folly. And they've admitted as much. They cannot come close to meeting the needs of Montpelier's unhoused population. And yet you're pretending, la la land, that, that that's our solution. And we all we need to do is, you know, pack them into the building. And what if they go out to smoke in after hours? Is it, it, it is it locked? Is it a jail? You know? But the the site that was trashed was I was told I was up there the other day and I took photos and they're pretty gross that particular site. It's the same folks that had ruined the, you know, the Confluence Park and had been run off of the camping at uh, at National Life, steered by our social worker, right? And created big disruptions up there and basically has resulted in everyone who's up there being told to leave. Good Samaritan was hoodwinked and tricked and manipulated into providing some notice to those folks that they had to leave, but that's not the way our encampment policy is written. The city has to provide written notice to these encampments, and it didn't do that. And to just the idea of you will end up in court if you try to trespass people from public property when you don't have shelter space. So you need to get a plan. The city is obligated to get a plan for where are we going to allow people to be? And Sal's memo, everyone should read it. Sal's memo in response to Carolyn Ridpath, I think, on the Homelessness Task Force laid out. The only reason we're not going to allow camping anywhere is because we're then responsible for providing bathrooms and, and trash removal. So my point is that this is an urgent issue that has not been dealt with by the Homelessness Task Force, by the council. The council did say they were... More than 30 days ago, they were going to put a fast track on getting this plan together. And what have you done? 
you've done zip. You've allowed your staff to continue to clamp down and clamp down and try to run people out of town. And that's just, it's irresponsible, it's inhumane, and it's a disgrace. Anybody else in the room? Uh, Aiden, I am came up here as a concerned community member. I agree. It's a disgrace, inhumane way to treat people. Um, any one of us here can become unhoused at any point. How are we as a community are going to believe anything that the council says that is saying they're looking for this community's best interest, but then show up and add policies and show up at people's homes with the police task force, walking through people's homes, AKA tents. I'm quite sure if we did that at your house, you'd be upset. It's inhumane, disgusting, something to be shameful. I would like to see the community concentrate on food. Hold on, I lost my place. I'm I'm I get nervous when I speak. Give me a minute. We need to include folks in the community gatherings and concentrate on food drops rather than calling the city council or cops for the sake of comfort for others. Let's dehuman Let's decriminalize this and work with folks rather than pretending that we have their best interest and then our action shows otherwise. Thank you. Yes. No, I'm good. I was just agreeing on him. Oh, oh okay. I thought, you were... I thought you were raising your hand to be recognized. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. And thank you, Aiden and Steve, for saying something. My name's Nolan Carver. I was recently privileged to join the Homelessness Task Force. Um, so I was having this conversation with the Parks Commission and the Conservation Commission as well. Um, sometimes these issues overlap. It occurs to me that we're at a crossroads in the history of the city of Montpelier. It occurs to me also that we're at a crossroads in terms of our community integrity. I believe that this can be an opportunity for the capital city to lead Washington County, the state, and even the, the nation. I hope that by the time this meeting is over that we will have given some good thought into essentially what the council is being accused of now, which is the inhumanity of depriving someone of their last resort, which is their tent in their home. They have made a home here in central Vermont. They've been displaced from other states as far as the deep south and so forth and so on. And they've arrived here with good reasons. They're safe here in central Vermont, although obviously the winters are severe. We've been kicking people out of the home um, hotel motel program. That was highly controversial. And so it's a luxury for me to have a debate on these points, but some of us don't have that voice or opportunity always to have the kind of you know, articulation, you know, and, you know, even civilized conversations, you know, so that's where I'm just trying to be this, you know, um, you know, I'm trying to just kind of forge, the, uh, um, you know, community cohesion, because we could take this to the police, or we could take this to the homeless shelter, or we could take this even to our next door neighbor. But I just like to remind you all, um, and as I did with the Parks Commission and the Conservation Commission, we, we are essentially outlying survival and criminalizing survival. So I just want to kind of 
just say I'm concerned with the division that some bad behaviors can 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 do. Some trashing here, some bad behavior there, and in and the rest of the population homeless is 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 stigmatized. That's the danger of getting the police involved. If there was a way that we could somehow avoid that, I think it would allow more civility to transpire. So thank you. I needed to just say something. Thank, thank you for listening. Thanks, Nolan. Thanks for coming. You're back. welcome. In the back, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. So my name is Sindhu Connolly. Um, I'm a Montpelier resident. Um, I'm somebody who does use the space um, for community gardening up at Elks Lodge. And I haven't, like, I haven't noticed the campers um, as something that's negative effect negatively affected me and during my experience um, up at the garden. And I've honestly, I've always seen it as an issue with what's happened with the floods and what's happened historically, at least um, in America, displacing people. And I just wonder if we get, if we kick all these people out, where else are they gonna go? It's kind of like shelving the problem to have to deal with it later. I mean, yeah. Um, it doesn't seem like a solution to constantly watch these people um, and like send them a bunch of <laughs> informationals about when they need to leave and who's going to contact them so they can leave. Um, and I'd like to see uh, more support for our fellow community members who have to, yeah, um, exist at their last resort. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dr. O. Thank you. I had to get myself off of mute. I, I'm still very concerned about the fact that when I'm up there, if there's any issue that makes me feel unsafe, it's dogs wandering all over off leash, not in voice control for people, but I'm not trying to get you all to correct the dog situation. I'm just trying to have you treat the humans at least with as much con consideration as the dogs are getting right now. And that that sounds like a little quip, but it's not. Actually, I watched the whole conversation about Hubbard Park, and there was a lot of resistance to anything that had to do with um, playing nicely across all these different stakeholders. So as a stakeholder with different needs than the dog holders, I don't like the fact that they seem to be ranked higher and that the homeless seem to have no say at all here. I don't see why with 19 days is a long time, we can't find a way to open up those bathrooms. And if you have a dirty site over there, it's because people don't even have water. They don't have access to water. So camping seems like a reasonable temporizing method. I know the legal issues about what if something terrible happens? What if I get bitten by one of these dogs that come charging up at me? I've had three out of four days where dogs have charged up at me and their owners are like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. They don't usually do this. Okay. So I'm just being very real about there's one group here that's being demonized, but there's a lot of different people who just really all need to play a little nicer together. That's my thought. And the city could help right now. Trash and access to the toilets. I hear that you can't open up the shelter yet, but when you open it up, it's still not going to take care of this problem. There's too many people. Thank you for listening. Thank you. And I do want to point out that there, there is a pet policy, policy as part of this proposed policy, which requires pets leashed or under voice command and... We'll see how that works. I'm uh, I'm not persuaded that everyone who thinks their dog is under voice command actually is. But uh, I was told that one person had seen only one dog. When somebody who's up there all summer had seen one dog truly under voice command. And I wanted to also add that what Nolan said: only four percent 
of our homeless came from anywhere else. Only 4%. Everybody else lost their housing while they were Vermonters with a capital V. So please don't spread that particular um, misconception. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, council members, um, where are we here? Kelly, maybe you could unshare so that uh, we can see each other. Thanks. Oh, do we have another person? Okay, come on up. Uh, name's still Azula, pronouns are she, her pronouns. I just wanna comment on the way that y'all have handled the encampment at Country Club Road. Um, last month, y'all said a variety of things such as like, this is not, an eviction, et cetera. This isn't anti-homeless, all that. Um, I don't know. Uh, speaking to campers this month, they're under the impression that, you know, last Friday, if they didn't leave, the cops would be called on them. And that to me sounds like an eviction. Like just everything about the way that y'all discuss the encampment on Country Club Road at Elks Lodge has been extremely dishonest. You've repeatedly shown that the people of Montpelier and Washington County in general cannot trust you. Um, and it seems like your solution to any flavor of poverty or struggle is like, just send the cops after them or use good hearted people who have good intentions at Good Sam as the intermediary to do the good, uh, the dirty work for you. Um, that's disgusting. There's some great people working for Good Sam and they're made to be the ones that deliver the, hey, you have to leave or you're getting arrested. That's not any better. Um, so here's a little solution. If you don't have a place to set people up with somewhere good to live, stop sending the cops after them. <laughs> stop pushing people from where they're living. It's been repeated several times this meeting. Um, this is folks' last resort. People are trying to survive out there. They were taking pretty decent care of the sites that I hung out at. Um, and it's just time after time, site after site, they get pushed around. It doesn't matter if they're doing anything. Frankly, if someone is trashing a site, I don't, I don't really care if y'all are pushing people out of their tents. That's disgusting. Y'all should be ashamed. I don't know how you uh, sleep at night. Um, I hope it's very tumultuous and not restful at all. Y'all discuss me. Goodbye. Thank you. I'd like to oh. offer a couple of comments on that because I, I basically agree with everything you said. Um, you know, the point that you raised about who goes out to to see people, and it, it kind of goes to our what we've been saying over the long is that we don't have the capacity, the resources. You know, we're going to be talking about budget. We just it was suggested that we look hard at the funding we give to social service agencies that help provide these services, right? Because, because uh, of the, the impact on taxpayers and, and others. So our police are going because they're the only people we have. And largely it's been the police chief or the deputy chief to check on, see how people are doing and to see uh, if um, just what the numbers are. Have, are people there? Are they not there? How are, What's going on? I'm not aware, and the chief's here who's been doing it, that they've been going into people's sites. I think they've been trying to talk to people and see how they're doing. We haven't, unless someone has committed a crime or through their action, we haven't arrested anybody. We haven't issued no trespass notices. We've been trying to see how things are going. We are very sympathetic to the situation. And we don't have the wherewithal. So good Sam, we pay them money to help do exactly what they're doing because they are our representatives in that situation. So I, I understand that you feel we're sending them to do the dirty job. That is our contractual relationship. That is what they do for us. So I, I appreciate that concern. You know, I've been up, Kelly's been up, we've looked around to see nobody. Uh, so we, it, it's hard. On the other hand, we cannot handle, if we were to say, fi fine, camping's okay here, and this isn't meant to be pejorative, but you all know how many people would be up there if how big would that encampment be? It would be hundreds of people. And you know the types of issues that could occur and and the, the our ability to handle that situation. So how do we manage it in a way that people are safe that are up there, that that people that we have a situation that we can keep under control if there were a call? Um, and it's very difficult. You know, here's, I'm actually working on this, as I said, with other communities. In 2020, 
the, the, the point in time survey, which I, I completely agree is not, you know, totally correct. But at 2020, there were 1,100 unhoused folks in Vermont. In that same survey this year was with 3,500 people. So the, the problem is, you know, quite, almost quadrupled, three and a half times in four years. So, you know, certainly COVID, floods, all sorts of things. It's not just Montpelier. Everyone's dealing with this and no one in these local governments have, you know, we don't have, we have a half-time social worker who is shared with Barry and with Washington County Mental Health. Um, we don't have any other folks in, in those capacities. So yes, our police and fire are the only, our first responders. They get called to these scenes because there just is no one else. Our public works people who are supposed to, um, you know, be plowing our roads and doing road projects have had to clean up unsanitary messes to the point that we've, we've now had to hire a contractor to do that. So we are using the resources that we have to try to address this in as safe way as possible. We also hear from a lot of people um, about folks that live in the community that also feel that they're not able to access property because it's been taken over. And so we've got to balance that. Yeah. People are paying their taxes, paying their fees. They want to use a bike path. They want to use the park. Uh, and frankly, it's, it's I, I don't, I, I'm joining with many other communities. We don't know the right thing to do. We can't provide the services to manage a whole site. I mean, Steve is right. Temporary housing would be great. But again, that requires someone to oversee it. And, um, you know, and, and the situation in Burlington has worked sort of, but people aren't moving out of there because there's still no place to go. So they're in those pod houses for longer than anybody hoped. So I'm sorry I, if you feel like we are after you. Um, and I can understand why people would feel that way. And I want to at least hear how we're trying to understand the situation you're in and also manage these things and not create a situation that is completely out of control for you, for us, for the general public. So sorry you were going to speak. I'm sorry I got in before you. Okay, come on up. Hello, my name is River, um, pronoun she, they. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I want to point out, one, the ridiculous equivocation that you haven't no trespassed anyone and that being a deliberate, blatant misrepresentation of having sent Good Sam to the site to tell people that they would be removed and that the police would show up later to no trespass them, which the police did walking through all of the sites looking for people to find. Um, just absolutely ridiculous. Um, yeah, I, I was there. I watched, I followed the police as they went through sites. And, and, and if I may and, interrupt, please, how many no trespass orders did they issue that day? None, because the campers weren't there because they were scared off because of the implicit threat of state violence and that you many, issued and, against them through Good Sam and, delivering and many, that message. And how many been issued since? Mm. I'm not going to argue this. This okay. is... You know no... the intent that you have. You're drafting a policy to set that intent to further justify the actions you've decided you're already going to take. This is going to be a continuing issue that will get worse year over year. We all know it. Climate change is going to keep happening. We will keep having disasters. We will keep having people displaced around the state, around the country, and they will need somewhere to live. You don't have the resources to help them. You do have the resources to make their lives worse, and that's what you're doing. Stay out of the way. These people don't need someone to oversee their sites. They can oversee themselves. The community can take care of each other. But you do not need to be sending cops to threaten people's lives, people who have had people who have had traumatic experiences with cops in the past, who have had their sights gone through by people who have no idea what they're looking for and saying that it's too dirty to save any of the things and throwing out their paperwork, their social security cards, their birth certificates, that they can't access the services that you tell them to go use in later situations. When people get displaced from site to site, that's what happens. I don't trust you to know what you're looking for when you're going through these sites, to know whether or not it's 
too dirty to salvage everything, whether or not there are important things that people need to access services that will keep them alive, you don't know what you're looking for. <laughs> and that's what you're going to do. You're going to go through these sites. You're going to clean them up. You'll save the cleaner ones, throw away the dirtier ones, probably the people with more severe mental health issues who have been displaced more times in the past. So they get re-traumatized over and over again, and the problem gets worse and worse. It's ridiculous. It's shameful. It's disgusting. You need to be more creative in your solutions. You say it's the state's problem? Figure out a way to put pressure on the state. The capital is down the freaking street. You can put pressure on Scott to actually take action to help provide the resources you say you need. Thank you. That's your time. We are actually doing that. Can I close with a very brief? There's someone else speak. And, and you've already spoken, Steve. Hello, um, my name is Marlo Van Dyke. I'm also a member of the community. I'm a resident in Montpelier. I spend a lot of time up at the Elks Lodge property as well um, at the community gardens. And I would just like to add my word that like others, I feel like I've been respected there as a community member by the people who had camped there in the past. Um, I feel like also the land up there is quite expansive um, and that there is plenty of space, like Dr. O said, for people to go around with their dogs and enjoy the land, um, enjoy the scenery. There's a lot of time and space for recreation that I feel like it's being ignored. Like the people who are camping there have been respectful of the space for the most part and they've stayed to themselves. And when I've gone up there as well, I feel like they've been friendly to me and like I can greet them and like enjoy the space myself. Um, and like others have said, I feel like the situation of homelessness is just like so chaotic um, to have people being pushed out on the daily and feel like they're being surveilled when they're just trying to make their way and like finding government documents, keeping track of everything that you own while also having to deal with being pursued by the police and the city and having trauma dealing with that in the past. I just can't imagine that it would be terribly stressful for them. Um, and I really feel like as somebody who, like, forgive me, I don't really know a lot about like policy and all of these fancy words, but it doesn't sound like there's any like clear solution to actually helping people um, find a place to stay and like get back on track. It, it really does feel like they're just being pushed out and seen as a nuisance, um, which I don't believe is fair or humane. And yeah, that's all. Thank you. Um, folks, uh, council members, uh, where are we here? We've had a proposed policy. We've had some, uh, we've had some uh, specific comments of things that uh, they could be tweaked to it. Uh, I'm just curious if people think we're we're generally on the right track, or if there are any significant uh, changes that you would like to see, because I think we're clearly going to ask the uh, staff to do some work on it and come back. Um, what are your thoughts? I also think we need to recognize that uh, while the city is doing what we can within the limits of our resources, it's uh, it's going to be inadequate to meet uh, meet the need, and we've been working with with state to try to get the funding and additional resources and we're, we're going to continue to do that um palin so what's the plan for the next 19 days is there any specific plan to support our community members at least like that uh, next 19 days our plan is to keep doing what we've been doing you know, um, I appreciate people don't like city people going up there. It's city property. We have, you know, we are the stewards of that property for the for the all 
the community. And so it is as the property owners, we need to go up and see what's going on there. We have not gone into people's belongings. We haven't issued no trespass orders, but um, we, yeah. So we're, that's what we told you on August 14th, we were going to keep doing. That's what we've been doing. Um, and that's the continues to be the plan, but we also uh, can't, we can't for any, anybody's sake, allow the situation to grow. So we've got to manage it. Adrian. Um, you know, for the past month, maybe a month and a half, we've had, I mean, I'm fairly new to city council, but we've had a, a lot of folks come into our meetings and fill up the, you know, the chambers. And this is obviously a, you know, uh, a hot topic and it's not going away. It's something that we, you know, we really need to discuss and strategize around. And I know that you all have said, you've been talking to the state, you're working with partners. I would love for there to be a call to action for all this energy that's in the room for community members that I talk to every day. Um, you know, you all are, you know, working on, you know, trying to, I don't know, work with your partners, but what could we do? What could we do to help? What can the folks in the room do to help? Like what, how can we use this energy in a very productive, strategic way? And what is that call to action? What is that change that we're looking for? Um, we know that the city of Montpelier can't, you know, support everything. We can't build pods. We can't, you know, we just don't have the money and resources to do that. But what should we all be asking for? And I feel like, that's something that I'd love for the city to, you know, um, guide us. And with all your discussions, you know, all all the meetings that you're in, like, what could we do to help support you um, in your conversations for, you know, asking for resources or policy or, you know, whatever it is that you're seeking? I feel like there could be a whole bunch of people supporting you, but we just need to know what that is. Yeah, I mean, there's a list, uh, actually, uh, the group that I'm talking about, we're meeting tomorrow, and that's exactly what we're trying to come up with, this specific list of asks, very specific, whether it's funds or use of land or buildings or, um, you know, funding to local governments to help support us or whether it's ramped up services or uh, uh, short-term housing. Uh, there, there's a quite a list, and we're, we're honing that down. It's basically every city or town in the state that has of any size that's having uh, folks, you know, trying to figure out how best to serve these folks and their community at large. And yes, we're going to be how, I don't know how we're going to be approaching the state because there's a different, you know, we're, we're working that out, how we're, what, what the best approach there is, but there will be a, a very specific ask of the state in a pretty direct way. And it will be really soon within the week. Um, yeah, we've already had heard from you. Um, uh, other comments from council members? We can simply ask Bill and Kelly to come back with the, some revisions. Um, should those revisions essentially be tweaks to uh, the policy as it is, or do you want, are people interested in seeing anything more major? Right okay. now, what I had down was uh, making sure we're clarifying the parking lots and paved roads, or exception, making sure that being at the shelter after hours, and I would say, you know, maybe even something with any permitted use, maybe a Boy Scout troop wants to have a camp mm -hmm. or something, and we specifically give permission to that or something like that. Um, or There's something else. Uh, it was something about the hunt, clarifying hunting, yeah. Um, that um, that firearms only under specific hunting circumstances. Those, those mm -hmm. are the three I And just a point of clarity, uh, where are we at on alcohol and drug use? Do we want to have the alcohol use mirror what is in the Hubbard Park policy, or do we want to stick with what's in the policy currently as drafted? Um, folks, what 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 are you thinking? Keep it the way it is or keep it... Uh, move it to what we have at Howard Park. Yeah. Carrie. Yeah, and I mean I I 
I wouldn't want it to be different from how it is in Hubbard Park, unless there were some really different circumstances there. And so the, I, I, I'm not sure how I feel about that, but I'm just, I, I feel like we need to really answer that. Um, if we're, if we're going to be, con I, I would like us to be consistent. And in other ways, this policy is consistent with Hubbard Park. And so I would like to stick with that. People generally agree with that? Grant, figuring that we can, uh, when it comes back to us, we can make a different decision when when we get there. Yeah, Palin. Uh, accept it as a park? It's not a park. So that's, uh, will it be okay to use same thing with the park regulation? Is well, it okay? We're creating regulations for it. It's city-owned property, so we can create rules okay, and regulations so because, for its use. Okay, because sometimes it, oh, this is not bad, so we cannot use the same policy. That's what I was just want to confirm. So there will be no um, future issues about it. Right, this is the policy. Once we have a policy, this will be the policy for that land. And presumably, it's not going to be this way forever because we'll be de developing it. Yeah, for... okay, thank you. I wasn't asking about the policy. I was asking if we are using the same regulations for parks, but this land is not a park, will it be any issues about it? That's all I there want to confirm. We have ordinances about parks. Okay, okay. I think we are ready to move on. Um this discussion will continue. Thanks to everybody for coming to uh, share your thoughts. Next up, we have the responsible contractor policy. And uh, should we call this a Open this as a first. This is a first public reading. hearing. Yeah, first had a reading. Discussion at the last meeting, and you said okay. you wanted for first reading. Okay, so Kurt, welcome. Um, first reading of the proposal. Thank you. I'm Kurt Modica, Public Works Director. Um, so we discussed this last time, uh, and the proposal uh, for um, consideration tonight is a two-year suspension of this ordinance as the city works through. Um, flood recovery and um, and difficult um, difficult financial situation. So, I mean, I don't I don't necessarily think there's um, I need to rehash what we talked about in the last meeting, but happy to answer any questions that anybody has. But um, generally, it's just a, a two year suspension um, for to assist us financially. One one question that was asked at the last question at the last meeting we have. Uh, looked at it uh, was whether our own employees met this and, and they do they meet and exceed the, the wages that are in this uh, so, so yes we are also paying these wages to people um Kurt, what as i've been thinking about this um clearly the reason we adopted this ordinance was to make sure that uh the people who are doing uh, work for the city and on based on city projects and city funds are getting paid uh, decent uh, pay and benefits. Is there any way for us to find out if the people that are if if we would if people would be getting those uh, uh, essentially the pay and benefits that the ordinance or the policy calls for without uh, the policy being in, in existence? You know, because we hear people say, well, workers are in such high demand that they're getting paid more than this requires anyway. Is there any way to find that out? I mean, I could certainly ask um, the contractors working in the city, what, you know, uh, how much of a difference exactly um, they'd be paying with this ordinance uh, versus without it. Um, but just to note that we, with the the way the ordinance is currently written, um, we do not get any any uh, verification of what people are actually getting paid. Um, it's just a it's a sign in and sign out sheet, and and that's the contractor certifies that they're complying. But we don't actually get certified payroll to verify it. 
No, I, I, I certainly get that, but my sense of the discussion in previous meetings it, is that uh, one of the reasons that that a con that contractors uh, don't want to come is isn't necessarily because of how much they would be required to pay the workers, but uh, the administrative burdens that they perceive this ordinance to uh, to impose. So if if suspending the ordinance relieves them of the administrative burdens without undercutting what the workers are getting paid, then that would seem to be a positive thing. Yep, that's right. We have heard from um, the school street school street contractor that um, that it is it is sort of a, a burden for them to manage every time an employee signs in and signs out, and also to track which type of work they're doing, whether it's concrete work or uh, flagging or um, you know pipe work or labor, because every time they do a different task, then they have to pay them the appropriate rate. So um, there is sort of a high level of overhead to manage. Um, these these wage rates. So I would take if you could take it as an information request for me to see if you can find out. You know, people are kind of reticent about their uh, their pay, but as much as you can find out about what what people are getting paid would be very helpful to me as we think about this. Yeah, I can certainly ask the question, but they're they're not necessarily obligated to share that with me. Right. Um, Sal. Well, I, I wasn't clear from the last meeting that the the increased cost that the school street contractor was talking about was solely due to um, management of of the uh, work classification. That my, my assumption was that at least part of it was uh, in increased wages that had to be paid, which I think answers your question. But I, I could be wrong. Well, I, I can't. Yeah, I can't say. For, I can't say that it's a hundred percent administrative burden. I can just say that that is a component of the added cost. I, you know, I do think that there is um, some impact. I expect. I haven't a hundred percent verified that with a contractor, but I do expect there are some wage impacts. I don't think it's a complete wash. Any other council members? Um. Public yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll go ahead. Just quick clarification. I on the independent contractor piece. Um, so it's not prohibiting contractors from using independent contractors. They just have to pay them as if they were. Right. Some subcontractors to the to the GC general contractor would be required to also have these rates, and and follow the sign in and sign out and all the other components of the ordinance. But there's no prohibition against hiring people in that category? No. Thanks. Okay, since this is a public hearing, I'll open the public hearing for uh, comments from the public on comments or questions from the public on this uh, proposal. Steve, here. Just like a clear, Steve Whitaker, I'd just like a clarification. We're basically suspending the current ordinance for two years. That's so the that proposal. Th there's no just need for the merits of it. But I, I support the fact that people are being well paid now working in the field. We've got some great contractors out there and we need to not choke it to where we only get one bid or no bids on projects. We got a lot of projects that need acceleration. Any other members of the public want to be heard? Okay, I will close the public hearing. Sal, do you just do you have your hand up intentionally or not? Okay. Uh, Carrie. Thank you. Um, I I just want to reiterate my um, opposition to waiving this. Um, I I'm I, I I'm not convinced that the administrative burden is so high as to um, stop people from submitting bids. Um, if that is the case, then I think the solution is to change the administrative burden. And right now, the way it's written includes a sign-in, sign-out sheet, um, which 
seems to me to contradict the idea that we don't have any way to verify that they're paying correctly. Because if we're asking them to do a sign in and sign out, then it seems like that is the verification process. So we could get rid of that. Earlier on in the ordinance, it says that they're supposed to, you know, promise under oath that they're going to comply with this. And I would be satisfied with that. I mean, the state has similar standards in some of its contracting processes, where it just says you have to swear that you're going to do this. And then, you know, if there's some reason to suspect that they're not doing it, then we take it up then. But if the problem is that it's, if they're really paying prevailing wages already and they just don't want to have to do a lot of extra paperwork to demonstrate that to us, then let's get rid of the extra paperwork requirement. And so then we can then we'll feel confident that people are getting paid prevailing wages, which is the whole point of this ordinance. That's yeah. scary. Could I just yeah. briefly respond to that? Um, so, uh, so I think the impact is um, the the administrative burden is um, is partially just tracking what each employee is doing because the wage rates change depending on the activity. And I think the the issue as far as impacts to bidders is really the smaller contractors that don't have, you know, project managers that are separate from the same person that's, you know, running the excavator. Um, that it's just really hard for small contractors to manage that. And so you you are essentially reducing the amount of contractors that bid on, on some of these projects. Gary. And can I just clarify, um, small contractors, I mean, we're, if we're talking about projects that are over $200,000 that are things like the School Street project are... Uh, is it realistic that you know a, a small contractor that's just one or two people might be doing that, or is, are those more typically done by companies with HR departments and payroll and all of that? Uh, so, because Vermont is so small, a lot of our uh, bidding contractors are are also really small. Um, so I wouldn't say two people, but you know, uh, ten people. But the owner is 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 also. Um, uh, one of the crew members and so and they don't have hr or but they do they are able to bid you know potentially up to like a million dollar project um it's just the the makeup of the contractor base in vermont is that there's um, there's a lot it's very common for uh, uh, owners to be a, a component of the um of the crew one of the members of the crew and they don't have administrative people to to track this sort of thing but so if we gave somebody a list of, you know, a list of the job categories and wages, the prevailing wage uh, publication, and we said, here's what you got to do. Here are the standards you need to meet. And in order to be a bidder, all you need to do is sign under oath that you will pay the wages according to this. Wouldn't that take care of that? Again, the issue is that um people within a crew will perform multiple tasks within a day so if they're operating a piece of equipment they're paid one rate if they get out and install a pipe then they're paid a different rate so it's not you have to track what they're doing and they could be paid three different rates in a day the way these things are structured because they're doing three different tasks so in that case they would have to pay the highest of all the rates in order to not have to track it and and kind of remove themselves from that uh, administrative burden and just to clarify what you're saying um are you saying that like a contractor will typically just hire a crew and the, the guy will get paid the same same hourly rate for the whole day or if they take a guy off running uh, a person off running an excavator for half the day and have, has them flagging, would they be paid at a lower rate for the flagging half of the day? Right. Typically without wage rates in the contract, they would just be paid a rate, whatever the rate that is, regardless of what activity they're doing. You're 30 bucks an hour or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Carrie, do you have a follow-up? I do. So 
So I just want to be clear that we we can't feel confident that they're being paid the prevailing wages for their work. I, I, I feel like I've heard that suggestion, not so much from you, Kurt, but from other people in this conversation that, oh, everyone's getting paid well already. That's fine. We don't have to worry about people getting paid well enough. I don't feel confident about that um, at all with this explanation. And the point of this ordinance is so that the city can feel confident that the people who are doing the work on behalf of the city are being paid the prevailing wages. So that's why I'm not in favor of waiving it. Okay. Any other council members have any questions? Sal? Um, I'm in favor of waiving it because we can't afford it. Um, I think we need, we need to attract small bidders. Um, an additional complication that hasn't been mentioned, I think was mentioned last meeting, is that not everybody works on the city job all day, every day. And so the, the entire payroll mechanism has to be adjusted, um, you know, day by day almost, or week by week. And that's, that's um, difficult for any contractor, let alone a smaller contractor. But um, I think, I don't know how the prevailing wage is calculated for Washington County, um, but I imagine across the state, um, wages are, are, are different in different areas. And I, I think under the current circumstances, anybody who wants a job with a contractor can, can get one at, at what is the prevailing wage for Washington County. Okay. Um, is there anything more to this discussion? Are we ready to move to uh, re ready for a motion? I do not want to prematurely cut off uh, discussion, but uh, the the pro the chair would entertain a motion to set this for a second reading at a future date. We have to specify the date, right? It would normally be scheduled for our next meeting, which is what the twenty uh, fifth. Are you moving? Yeah, so moved. <laughs> I'll second. Moved by uh, Palin, seconded by Sal. Um, will uh, any further discussion? We'll do a roll call going around the table. Sal, I'm. Uh, uh, yes. yes. Sal, um, Adrian. Yes. Carrie. No. Palin? Yes. Kim? Yes. Okay. The motion passes. We're on for two weeks from tonight. And look at that timing. It's 824. Time for our 10-minute break. Um, we'll see you back here at 834, 835. Time for... Um, for us to reconvene, uh, call the meeting back to order at uh, 8.35 p.m. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the first reading of a, the proposed amendments to the parking ordinance, item nine on our agenda. And we'll turn this over to you, Kelly. Thanks a couple of the Kelly show. Hello, everyone. Uh, Kelly Murphy, Assistant City Manager. I can pull up the ordinance on the screen if you'd like, but I think for the purposes of the discussion, what I'd like to do is just give a brief summary of the proposed changes, um, and then if needed, we can get into the language specifically, if that works for folks. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so just for the public's benefit, um, the draft um, proposal for the changes to the ordinance um, the parking ordinance are available online along with the agenda items. And then we have a quick summary in the cover, but I'm just going to go through what we've changed um, in brief so that we've got it and then we can take it from there. So um, for starters, um, the, the first item that um, is up for consideration is 
um, adjustments to sections 10-703, which is the installation of meters, 10-704, which is hours of use and rates, and then 10-708, which is coin deposits and time violation. Um, and these sections have been modified to include language that um, would comply with use of Park Mobile. The next uh, sections um, that have been amended, and by the way, I just want to note that um, within the ordinance, I've highlighted um, the language that has been changed. Um, so it's not the full ordinance, it's these specific items um, that we're talking about today. So there's a few kind of cleanup items and then the bulk of substantial languages around the appeals process. Um, so just getting into the additional items. Um, so we've got uh, an amendment to the tow away and loading zones on Main Street and then Langdon Street. Um, and so the first of which is section 10.715D, tow away zones and elimination of zones. Um, and that is on page six. Um, and so essentially what it does is it eliminates the Main Street um, bus stop and adds a 15 minute loading zone, which then goes on to page uh, 15, which also includes um, Langdon Street um, where there uh, is one currently and it removes um, that item. So then so this is the section right out in front of City Hall. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, and then the next one is um, the citation for violations, which is within section 10 719. Um, and so within this item, this is where we get into some of the specifics um, around fees and fines. And so what we're proposing is that all fees and fines be um, approved by council by resolution. Um, so we would take that up annually as part of the budget process. Also included in tonight's packet is an agenda item with um, a parking resolution for the current uh, fees and fines that are charged. Um, so we're not proposing any changes um, to those fees at this point. However, um, it is likely that we would come forward with additional changes in the future once we've been able to study those items. Um, and so moving on to um, the really the, the real the most important um, portion of this um, discussion is on page 17, the um, parking violation penalty. Um, this provides clarity to the parking ticket appeal um, process and sets timing for review. Um, we did seek legal advice on this particular section um, and the legal advice that was provided is that the Supreme Court has said that there is no absolute right to continue to appeal and so within our ordinance, it wasn't clear, you know, what um, additional appeal might be allowed. And so we have been kind of operating um, with an appeal process um, for tickets that would go um, from the police department to the city manager's office. Um, and so this particular language offers clarity on that um, item. And so I'm just going to kind of read through what we've got there um, for you so you can kind of hear it because I just want to make sure that we're clear on what we are proposing. Um, so just let me get to page 17 of the ordinance here. Okay. So essentially uh, what we're looking to do is a person may appeal a parking ticket violation and may do so within 10 days of the issuance of the ticket. First, in writing to the Montpelier Police Department Chief of Police, if the appeal is denied, the person may choose to submit the appeal in writing within 10 days of the denial to the city manager or hearing officer for final decision and may choose to appear for a hearing. A hearing will not be automatically scheduled and will be waived if the appellant does not request such a hearing in writing. If the appeal is denied, the city manager or hearing officer, but the city manager or hearing officer, there is no further appeal and will be certified as such. Having exhausted the appeal process, violations may be brought to Superior Court Criminal Division for enforcement of municipal parking violations for adjudication. And so that's what we've proposed, the uh, underlying language there. Um, there is a section that is struck also. Um, so that's uh, what we have here within the ordinance. I also do wanna note that we did uh, review the um, ordinance for uh, gender language and neutralized it. Um, so that's also been done as part of this review. Um, and so that's what we have here within the um, ordinance in front of you as proposed changes. Um, and I'll take questions. 
Thanks, Kelly. Uh, council members, any uh, questions? I'll, I'll mention that uh, in discussion with the city manager, I, uh, I sent Bill and Kelly uh, a couple of emails suggesting not changes, amendments to this, but changes to specific uh, parking areas within the city so that uh, updating the um, the parking spots in front of uh, the federal building so they would no longer so go to two hours instead of uh, the 30 minutes they are now since it's not being used as a post office. And uh, also a suggestion that we review the uh, locations uh, around the city where there are crosswalks because as we drive around, I, we notice a number of areas where the cars are parked really pretty close to crosswalks and uh, it can be hard to see uh, if someone's looking across. And so uh, I assume that there are some uh, federal highway standards to that, but uh, whether we should comply with the federal highway standards or something uh, more protective of uh, pedestrians is something that uh, I think is worth the conversation. So I'll suggest that we take that up in uh, at the next uh, hearing, assuming we get that far. Um, Carrie? Thanks. Um, yeah, so I, I think this is this is really helpful. Lots of good clarifications. I like your thoughts, Jack. They make sense to me as well. Um, so I don't have any, I, 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 and I do want to say I really like the idea of setting the the fee schedule by the, that the city council does that every year, and that's not written into the ordinance. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I, I just want to talk about the appeals process part. I, um, I, I had to read it multiple times and really kind of think about it um, to understand how it worked and it's still not 100% clear to me. I think I got it, but it's mostly just because of the way it's written. There's like a super long run on sentence. There's, you know, extra words. And it, it seems like a, like a copy and paste job that didn't go back and get fixed. And so I think it really needs that. And, um, I also wasn't sure what the hearing officer was and I'm just thinking if I were a person trying to appeal a parking ticket and read this, I wouldn't be 100% clear how to do it. So I just think it, I think the process, basic process is probably fine. Um, I think it's good to clarify that you get basically two chances to appeal and then you have to take it to court. I think I have no problem with the continuity of that, but I just uh, really would like to see that language dramatically adjusted for clarity. Thanks, Gary. Anything else? Or is that what you got? Okay. Yes, Al. Yeah, I uh, I agree with Gary on certain parts of it. It, it just it seems to me certain parts of it just um, need one more one more pass through um, because there are there are a lot of places where it's just confusing. It's it's hard to to really take the technical meaning of what's what's going on in the in the language because uh, of the run-on sentences and stuff um i sent i think this was on the agenda a couple of meetings ago and i sent some comments prior to that meeting but um you know i'd be happy to send uh, you know there are three or four places where i i think it it just needs a copy edit and i'd be happy to make suggestions and then uh, you know let the staff tweak the rest of it but um I agree with Carrie. I, I like the the way it's the direction it's going. Thanks, so. Um Any other council members have any comments at this point? Okay, since this is a uh, ordinance amendment, I open a the public hearing uh, for members of the public to comment on the proposed ordinance. If there's anyone in the room or online who would like to comment, Steve. Yeah, uh, this is going to overlap with the next item on the agenda. So I'm going to just try to lay a foundation here. Um, the hearing 
what what has happened in the past is a an appeal is filed. It's reviewed by the somebody in the police department or the parking division, maybe somebody asking a few questions, and it's either granted or denied. <clears throat> it then those responses have s said this decision is final, and that has never been true. So we've basically been misleading the folks that have taken the trouble to appeal and leading them to believe that that appeal was final. And that's not true. And I'm not sure this complies with state law either. Um, but a fundamental piece is that you need a impartial body, not a hearing, some vague definition of a hearing officer, certainly not a city manager or a police chief is going to be an impartial a person to hear evidence. They have to understand the rules of evidence. It's more like a, a board of appeals. Uh, uh, I don't know what you call the tax appeals. Basically, it's a cross-section of folks who are weighing the evidence to say this is fair or not. But no one has asked in five years since I was ticketed on Baldwin Street, no one has asked to see the photos where there was no markings. I was 12 feet from the fire hydrant and the there was no orange curb there and no one has asked in five years and i then showed up at the police department when they said we're going to hold a hearing and all it was was the deputy chief saying no evidence allowed this is your hearing speak up and i'm like what kind of kangaroo court is this you know so I've got photos of the car parked on Baldwin Street. I, I've got the Facebook post and the and, and the city can't find the original ticket, but I believe it says within four feet or six feet of a hydrant. And I was 12 feet from the hydrant. So the city apparently has not certified that they don't have a copy of the ticket, but they certainly haven't produced it. So that's a, a public records issue. But an impartial body. Also, it says that the, it can then go to criminal court. It doesn't say that the citizen, the aggrieved party, has a right to take it into civil court. And I believe it's rules of civil, civil procedure when no other appeal route is is, is specified. I think it's rule 75. It could be 35. I'm not a lawyer. But there's a rule that says when no other appeal route is specified, here's the rule you use to take it into superior court. So, but my point is that this, this is a poorly, this is a half-assed effort to modify an ordinance that is an example of how, of mismanagement over a really long time. We keep amending and amending this ordinance, you know, and we're not getting what we're paying for if this is all the product we've got. But you've got the key points, an impartial body to review, clarity on what the appeal. This alludes to the fact that it can be taken into criminal court, right? But only if the city elects to. If not, but if there's still an appeal route, you cannot boot somebody's car and, and take, tow their car away. There's also no waiver provision for an indigent person. Thanks, and, Steve. I, you're, I, I've got all your points here. Thank you. Any other members of the public? Kurt? No, nope, Kurt Modica, Public Works Director. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the uh, crosswalk spacing um, concern, just so we get a little direction, so we know um, uh, what to kind of propose when we come back for the next time. Um, there is a state statute that at intersections only, that there's a 20-foot space um, uh, between the crosswalk. Um, there is nothing in state statute about um, you know, mid block or not at you know inter uh, crosswalks that are not at uh, intersections. Um, the trick is uh, you know every situation is different. There's you know the bulb outs that come out into the road and those have a different distance required from the crosswalk. Um, there's potential line striping changes if it's marked parking that could be impacted by um, you know putting a blanket ordinance at ordinance requirement for the distance. So I think each one it really needs to be evaluated case by case. So the suggestion, and we had um, Corey look at this, Corey Line from our office, um, is, to, is to write in the authority, basically, in the ordinance to allow either city manager or the public works director um, to uh, restrict parking for up to 20 feet 
uh, from a crosswalk uh, for public safety or something like that. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I I don't my my thinking is that we wouldn't necessarily want to want to have the council have to debate and decide what the parking distance should be for every one of the crosswalks in the city. But uh, and and twenty feet is seems like it's more than it needs to be. But some of them it seems like they're pretty much right up to it. Yeah. So thanks, Kurt. Okay. Is there any other member of the public who wishes to be heard? All right. At this point, we will close the public hearing. Um, Kelly, do you feel like you have the guidance that, uh, that you need? I do. Thank you. Okay. So is there a motion to schedule this for a second public hearing? So moved. No. We, wanted to have it, we, can't have this right the next meeting. we can have it ready for next meeting. So the, 25th. So the motion the motion was on the 25th, right? I'm quite certain I heard that. Yeah. And is there a second? Second. All those in favor, any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Next up. Parking fee resolution. <laughs> you thought you were leaving, huh? I thought so, but no, that's okay. I'm here for it. Um, so um, within your packet, you have a draft parking resolution, which outlines um, all of the fees and fines associated with parking as they are currently within our system. Um, and so um, what we would be looking for you to do would be to adopt this resolution tonight, and then we would bring a modified resolution forward in the future for any changes that we may be seeking. Um, and just for the public, uh, the fees that are identified are parking fees for on-street parking, off-street parking, and permits. Um, and then we've got the parking violation fines, um, which are noted by instance. Um, and I can go through them all if you'd like, but they are available on the website. Um, council members have any questions or comments? The question I have, aside from the fact that this is just uh, adopting the rates we have now, right, is how do we decide um, what what the what the right amount is, like with the uh, with the monthly permit fees, it's a hundred dollars. I don't know if it should be a hundred dollars or one hundred fifty or two hundred. How how do we figure that so out? We in years past, we've done a number of different things, including taking a look at. I mean, there aren't that many places in Vermont, at least, that have paid parking. Right, it's a pretty small group of communities, and etc. Vermont is just us in the area, mm -hmm. but Burlington uh, is another Brattleboro, I think, maybe. So there's, there's really not many. Um, so we take, but we take a look at what people are charging for parking lots and what our demand is. You know, what do we have a wait list? You know, are we selling them out at this price? Or is it not? You know, um, I mean, there was a time when it could almost put any reasonable price on a monthly parking spot, and we, you know, sell them out. But that isn't now. Um, mm -hmm. So um, you know, and, when, and then we look at obviously some of it has to do with what our costs in the parking fund are. So trying to make sure we're covering our costs, but also taking, you know, trying to make sure our on-street rates are not out of whack with other people so that someone says, you know, I went to Barry and I spent 10 cents and I came here and I spent $10, you know, there's always going to be a little variance, but you, know, you want to make sure that, so that's usually the extent of the analysis that happens, you know, trying to figure out, we take a look at the number of, you know, we look at the trends and try to figure out what we mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else have any uh, questions? I, oh, I just thought? point out one other thing uh -huh. to the extent that we're talking about. The other thing with parking, particularly with the meters, um, is because we still have the coin capacity. You know, it's 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 a little bit of art inside. Like you really can only increase the rates by twenty five cent increments. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, it's not like, hey, let's just up the rates 2% this year, you know, and go from 10 cents to 12 cents or, you know, 25 cents to 28 cents or something. It's a, you have to wait till it's enough time, you know, to go all the way up to 50 cents or so. I think that's the other piece that it's, you know, we do have the, the, uh, the app parking, the park mobile, so we yeah. so that's a little more flexible. But it does, you know, if we're going to mirror it to the coin rates, you just also have to work within that construct. Have all our meters been converted to just taking quarters now? Yes, we only have we only have coin meters and the app. We don't have the cards anymore. Uh huh. And the ones that do take coins only take quarters. That was um, the question. I'm not sure about that. No, okay, that was the question I was asking. The, Sorry, I, I believe they take different denomination of coin because some places like they take all oh no okay. pennies probably no pennies. no pennies yep okay it's over in barry so i guess we could up the rates by 10 yeah. cents or something oh, five cents okay just quick question um so it looks like our base rate is really about 15 in here now for violations um seems to be where it starts what were the previous rates? Maybe for the next meeting, you could get us sure. current rate just to compare to see how we can increase this. Uh, so it's it's not an increase, um, but we can see we can look back to see the last time that they were amended, which may be quite some time. But they're similar. Yeah, they, these are the rates we're charging now. Okay, all right. right. This is just putting because before they were in the ordinance, and we've revamped the ordinance uh -huh. to say yeah. they've got to be adopted by fee resolution. So we're just having you do the resolution for the current fees. And then if we go to right. at budget time, if we want to change them, we can discuss it. But these are just I'm happy to look, new rates. I'm right? happy to look back if you'd like. Yeah. But if they're, if they're not I don't they're think they've done. been up. Um, the fines haven't been up for a long time. No, they they haven't. Um when we were reviewing this, we actually did take a look at the memo at the last time that they were increased just to see what standard we used. Um and so I can certainly provide that to council. What's the difference between expired meter time violation and parked overtime meter space? Um, sure. I, that, actually, that would be yeah, lovely. If, if you know the answer. I think I can do this. You only put, you're, you're in a two hour space, but you only put an, an, an hour in your meter. And then you, the meter expires, you're there. So that's a time violation of expired meter. That if you then stay over two hours, you've got a time. Now you're right. Did I get it? <laughs> Can I really? <laughs> okay. And uh, are are the current meters we have do not reset to zero when uh, a car pulls out, right? Because I think we, we were looking at meters that would do that. We have we have very low tech meters. We were talking about going to the high tech with the, all the sensors and everything else, but they were very expensive. And then the solar, we really just struggled with the solar batteries. We didn't get enough sun to really keep them running. So then they were down a lot. Uh, so we finally got a good deal and just said, let's go back to just old school coin meters that only do that and have a parking app. And that's the way people can, if they don't want to carry coins, they can use the app. And it's for the most part worked fine. Since then, we had a little bit of grumbling when we first did it, but we really don't hear about it at all now. Okay. Um, any uh, more comments or questions by the council? Any questions or comments from the public? Steve. Yeah, Steve Whitaker. Um, I want to point out that, and I raised it just a few weeks ago that one of the things that's really special about our town is our we we spent decades training people to respect our crosswalks and people will normally if they see you they will stop and allow you to cross um but then somebody delivering you know to positive pie didn't want to pull into the lot and just totally blocked the crosswalk parked at the you know parked across the crosswalk and unloaded his truck and his power lift and spent, you know, half hour blocking a crosswalk. And I couldn't get, you know, him ticketed quick enough. But even if he had, that ticket crosswalk would have been, oh, where is it? 
I just saw it. Fifteen bucks. Fifteen bucks. I I think it should be more like the the uh, handicap space. You know, three hundred dollars. You know, we, you can't you can't allow people to block our crosswalks, especially in an unattended vehicle. It we should be ticketing them for stopping and not waiting until they can clear the crosswalk before entering an intersection. Um, and that happens routinely. I've got plenty of photos of that, but. We need to preserve our walkability of a town. I think walkability is part of our, you know, town plan goals, city plan. Um, the disabled space is 306 and the crosswalk uh, on sidewalk. People sometimes get in close and one wheel ends up on the curb. Is that a, is that a sidewalk violation or is, is parking across the sidewalk? That's that's ambiguous here. Uh, I see people all the time. Merchants, in fact, are revered, you know, downtown merchants parking with the driver's side against the curb. They pull into any spot they can get, even across traffic, and they sit there. I, I didn't realize that that was illegal here, but it it, it apparently is. That's um, actually illegal under state law, too. <laughs> well, it happens all the time here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure the merits of why it's illegal, but um, prohibited it, it, area, it, it, no no parking signs or markings. That's the one where it, I think it applied to, I parked in front of Trinity Church's driveway when Trinity Church's driveway was closed for the season because of a, a sinkhole opened up after the flood, and it was closed for nine months or so and so totally got your point on that steve uh, i think the answer to uh prohibited parking is that you can't get to parking with the driver's side against the curb without driving on the wrong side of the road well i do support pulling it off into a resolution and not having to change the ordinance every time you want to adjust a fee. But I've just given you a number of fees that need to be adjusted, possibly before. This can't really take effect until the ordinance is amended or is, is amended. And I think I've given you some real cause for, you know, you don't want to end up in I don't want to have to litigate that for y'all. I'd rather you do your damn job properly before than require me to litigate your parking ordinance. Thanks, Steve. Um, I, I I kind of agree that the uh, crosswalk and uh, the sidewalk uh, maybe should be higher. I don't think it should be three hundred dollars, but fifteen dollars might be too low. Well. This will be, you know, again, you're welcome to do whatever you want. This was really intended to just keep what we're doing for the time being, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, so that when we finish this and it, uh, the amendment goes into effect, that this mm -hmm. will already be approved. We won't have a time when there's nothing. Okay. Is there a motion to adopt this ordinance or this okay. uh, resolution? So moved. Is there a second? Oh wait, you know, we we did I'm sorry, we did have a request to rewrite some of this. This is a second uh it's not a motion to adopt, it's a motion to set it for a second uh, reading. No, this is oh, this, this is, is the res fee resolution. Oh, you've already, okay. You've already, already done the that. ordinance to second reading with it with some suggested rewrites. Now this is the re fee resolution doesn't require two. Okay. Meetings. So it's moved, is there a second? Second. Any uh discussion all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. any opposed all right we have adopted the parking fee resolution next up um parking issues uh, mr whitaker you are up I mean, the way you're casting aside every detailed concern I bring to you doesn't leave me a lot of confidence that you 
know what you're doing. Um, so I've pointed out that I've asked for, I've made appeals and I've got the emails between Frazier and Nordenson saying, we don't know how to do a hearing. And then I've just given you test, you know, testimony that I show up for a hearing and we're not taking any evidence and it's certainly not an impartial uh, body. So you've got a broken ordinance, fundamentally broken ordinance. Uh, your ordinance is not based on a clear definition of what a hydrant area is. It's based on a number of feet from a hydrant. And I clearly didn't fall within that. And yet no one seems to try to sort that mess out, you know? So why are you just going through the motions of, of, of this when instead of trying to get to the bottom of the flaws in your ordinance? And if your ordinance conflicts with the rules of civil procedure and you're gonna boot and or tow somebody's car away before the appeals are exhausted, it, it makes no sense at all. I, I know you're not lawyers for the most part, but Jack, you should know better, you know? You, you should know that if the rules say there's an appeal, that you can't go towing somebody's cars before the appeals are exhausted. And yet you're threatening to do that. And you're, this is, this is a, uh, so it appears targeted as does your fees. I'm unable to get to the incident reports for what's really going on at Country Club Road because y'all adopted these exorbitant fees for getting at police records now. So you you foiled the police oversight that did exist even before you, when you timed you when you need it most, you know? And the oversight of, of parking enforcement and booting and, do you really wanna take somebody's a car, car away, you know? While it's um, ambiguous, I think the ordinance is unconstitutionally vague. I, I'm not based on the prior reading of the prior existing ordinance. I, I can't, uh, I haven't given a close enough reading to it. But I pointed out that this is litigatable and, and you are ignoring the, the, the key precise input I'm giving you on how you need to change it. It's like, oh, we adopted it, let's set it for another hearing. It's it's dumbfounding. It really is dumbfounding, you know? So you, you're, you want to go against our rules of civil procedure and tow somebody's car because the police decided not to send it to criminal court, you know? Well, let me, let me see if I can zero in Please on do. what you're getting at. Um, first off, you know, we had a discussion earlier of the proposed amendments to the parking ordinance, and those will uh, will will take some action at the, on those at the next meeting. But those changes, those amendments, don't ap apply to anything that's happened to you in the past. And so, what I want to clarify is what your claim is for what's happened to you in the past. Is it that you've not been afforded the appeals? repeal rights that you were entitled to or Correct. uh and and how was that, how, they, that they don't they don't have any idea how to hold a hearing i brought it to council five years ago in 2019 it's in your minutes and i said i want a hearing on this and it was the hydrant issue over on baldwin street i mean we don't enforce meters over on baldwin street so somebody went over there to target my car and it's 12 feet from a hydrant and the hydrant there is oddly placed up on a on state land, it's even beyond the the road center line right of way. It's but there's a bank there, yeah. Yeah, and there's clearly no yellow section as we do in every other hydrant area. We we paint a section of yellow curb, and if you're clear of that on either side, you're the proper distance from the hydrant. But we don't. Our ordinance didn't anticipate somebody moving a hydrant off up on the bank, and but yet. Frazier and Nordenson didn't know how to hold a hearing. And, and they, they're not impartial either. And, you know? and so when did this thing that happened? Well, I don't I don't think we're gonna 
fix something that happened five years ago. No, I think for my effort in helping you find the flaws in your ordinance, you should just waive any pending. You know, I think you, I've more than earned this by pointing out and suffering the indignity of having my car booted unjustly. And then most most of it has gone away, but there's still, I think, $136 or something that you're claiming I owe, you know. But, but your, your current claim is that uh, you there's been a decision to put your car on the list to be booted, and it's based on non-payment of parking uh, fines and- For which I've never for, been allowed to and, have and, a hearing. Uh, and for which you've never been allowed to have a hearing, okay. Um, let me hear from the city on what uh, their response to that is. So, uh, and I'm looking to Chief and Kelly to help me out here. Uh, my understanding is that Mr. Whitaker appealed certain tickets. Uh, I'm not sure if you appealed them all individually within 10 days of each one, which is what the ordinance calls for. Uh, the police looked at them, turned down the appeals, and then you appealed to Kelly. And Kelly, I remember, wrote a... Well, she wrote a response to an appeal to That's you. Than the to well, you asked for an appeal. You appeal to the city manager, and the city manager uh, to designated Kelly. Kelly to do it. Yeah, could be it. Okay, right. Or actually, you appeal to the city council, and there's no appeal. Whatever it was, we gave you a review, and I believe she did change some of the things, and you got those. Um, and then you still didn't pay, and then you had a boot hearing, which is different than an appeal on the merits. And you wanted to sort of fight all the merits all over again. And Kevin said, we're here to determine whether or not you're going to be booted. And um, and that was that. And then you got on the agenda and you asked for a stay. And I think I told you no. Um, and you have had a boot since, because I don't think you parked in public parking since, or at least you've done your best not to. Um, but... So the questions are, did you appeal, if you look at the ordinance, did you appeal each individual ticket in a timely manner? I'd say the answer to that is no. Um, you still got a review of all of them from both the police department and the city manager's office and got written responses. And I said, at least one of them got changed by the city manager's office. Uh, and then you, you know, uttered some utterance about us not knowing what we were doing or whatever. Then you appealed your boot hearing to the deputy chief expecting it to be an evidentiary hearing, which it wasn't, which it clearly says. And then you came to the city council. It says in the ordinance about the boot hearing. It doesn't say it's not an evidentiary hearing. It says it's solely for the purpose of determining whether a boot should be applied. It's not to appeal. So then I never did case. get the hearing on the evidence of the of the merits of the ticket. Kelly, do you have some inter I information? I do actually shed? have something to add here. And just to one point of clarification. Um, Based on the way that the ordinance is written right now, we really don't have an appeal process. And so we have been sort of acting, you know, based on past actions with appeals. So basically, you know, if somebody wants to contest a ticket, they would bring it to the police department. They would take a look at it. It would then go to the city manager's office. They would take a look. And then from there, if, you know, there is not a change made, the appeal is denied. We have done our legal review of this, and we are not required to offer an appeal for tickets. And so what we're doing here with the review of the ordinance is that we're actually trying to put an appeal process in place so it's very clear. We did review your cases. We did review each and every ticket just to make sure that you were heard and did offer the opportunity for you to appeal because there was really no designation of time. So, you know, we've really been trying to go above and beyond within sort of past practice to address the issues you have with parking. And so the current situation that you find yourself in based on, you know, our findings is that, you know, your appeals have been denied and the tickets are due and now you're in the boot process. That's where we're at today. And and I have a question because Mr. Whitaker stated that, uh, he he tried to submit evidence at his hearing that showed that his car was was parked farther away from the hydrant than the ordinance uh, 
says and that he was not allowed to submit that evidence. Do you have any information about that? Sure. I mean, so I think the hearing in question is associated with the boot hearing, which is not to provide or substantiate or argue further the merits of the appeal. Let me re-ask this. When, when you did the review of his tickets, did he give you information saying why he thought they were invalid? So he filled out the form, but in this particular instance, I do not believe that we had, you know, he that. He didn't provide you evidence. Is there a way for someone to provide evidence? Like, obviously, I think I've been in that position myself where I've put coins in the meter and uh, and it didn't register and it happens a lot. It happens a lot and someone appeals and they get uh, the meter head gets pulled or something and it's either granted or not. Uh, right. I mean, and that, that's why we do, you know, we in past practice, even though we don't have an appeal process within the current ordinance, is that we have heard appeals for that very reason. There may be an instance or a justification for, you know, a certain infraction. And we do want to hear those cases. And we do want to know if there's something that can be done because we're not, you know, out to get people. We're trying to just make sure that we can uphold the ordinance. Okay. Um, but in your interpretation of the ordinance is that if someone's appealing the uh, issuance of a boot order that that is not that doesn't come down to disputing whether the previous the underlying ticket was properly issued but simply whether there is the balance that would justify having a boot correct because okay. they've had their opportunity to do to appeal to be, the, to be the, each and every ticket, ticket that contributed to the boot. And this happened prior. Bill Bill suggested that filling out a form was a hearing. And I'm like, no, a, a hearing to present evidence is not filling out a form. And just basic legal procedure seems to be missing in this. An understanding but, of basic legal procedure seems to be missing in this ordinance. Because I've got the emails where Frazier and Nordenson say, we don't know how to hold a hearing. Is it before us? Is it before the court? The, the current ordinance says it's it can be referred to criminal court, but there's no memory of that ever happening. And if that's how far I have to go to get a hearing, I'm willing to, but yet they're booting the car ahead of time. So um, the prior ordinance said nothing about hearings. It only talked about appeals. You can have a written appeal, and uh, that's how it was handled. And it said if it's denied. The current suggested ordinance, which is irrelevant to your case, but um, allows for the second appeal, the, the the appeal to the manager's office or their designee or hearing officer or whatever, um, could then have a hearing and it will be set and there'll be a date. That is new. Um, there was never any requirement for hearing. Under the boot hearing, uh, it specifically says, uh, where is it? Uh, hold on. The hearing shall be conducted before the chief of police or his or her designee, which is what happened, and shall be limited as to whether said vehicle will be impounded, be impounded for unpaid or ordinance violation citations. The owner may at that time pay for any outstanding tickets. That's the hearing that you have. Okay, well, here's where you've got an unconstitutionally vague ordinance. If I'm never allowed a hearing to present evidence, then you've got a you've got an unsustainable ordinance. And I'm not surprised that this is what we get after 30 years of Fraser's high high rates. Good question. Yeah, Tim. So how many tickets or what's the dollar amount to trigger booting? What's is there a what's this, four, four tickets? Four tickets. And one of these, I was dutifully without a calendar and without much infrastructure. I mean, I was dutifully moving back and forth every night during the winter. And it never occurred to me that the 31st and the 1st are both odd days. I shouldn't have moved the car, you know? Gotcha. Um, when we do take in appeal forms at the front desk, we do allow people to submit photographs or any evidence they have. We just attach it to the appeal form. So I just want to let you know we do take that in and pass that along to the police. Okay, thanks. Council members, any other uh, questions? The other issue is the 
I requested that the privilege be waived because this the the, the there's no basis, no rational basis to keep secret the lawyer's advice on this topic because this ordinance is riddled with errors, and I believe Frazier's afraid that that's going to come out. And I'd like to make a motion that um, we abide by our city attorney's advice and deny the request to release the documents that Stephen wants. Um, I think our policy is, I mean, that, I guess that's my motion. And is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Ready for a vote on that motion? If so, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, members, is there a motion to take it or a proposal to take any action on uh, the remainder of Mr. Whitaker's request? Okay. Well, will it help? I mean, I think this shouldn't go on any longer. I can't believe it's gone on for five plus years. Um, and I'm really not pleased that it's gone to the level of taking our time at city council for parking violations. I think most people, when they get to this point, if you've made an error, pay their ticket and don't drag it out for five years. Um, I find this to be for the time you feel and the effort you've done to help us improve our ordinances. I have to say, I can't believe how much public resource and time and effort and cost you've put into, you've cost this community for your appeal because you just didn't admit you made a mistake and pay a ticket. Um, I don't want to see a, another process expand to be like an abatement hearing. I lived through those. It's hell. There's no reason to create another process like that for parking procedure. Uh, so those are my thoughts, and uh, I would move to deny this uh, appeal. You don't need to do okay. If that's what you want. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. You can make a motion or not. We could, we could simply take no action. If that's... I think we should make a statement. Okay. So, so you motion. move to deny the relief requested by the uh by Mr. Whitaker. Yes. Thanks. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Council members, do we have any discussion on this motion? Carrie. Yeah, I'm I'm not hundred percent clear what we would be denying. I'm not sure exactly what he's asking for. So I, I mean, I would prefer to just take no action. The staff has been handling it. I would rather let the staff just handle it and not step in. But if if, if we need, anyway, if we're gonna vote on this, I wanna know exactly what it is he's asking for. Mr. Whitaker, do you wanna give us a clear statement of what you're asking for? I'm asking for the uh, alleged, the emails between the attorney around. Oh, we've already acted on that. that. We've already voted on that. So the question is the other relief that you're requesting, if you could clarify exactly what you're asking. I've been asking for a hearing where I could present evidence to on these issues for five years. I came to the council and asked for that hearing five years ago. You weren't on the council, but the fact that nobody has acted on that since then and that it's gotten to this point it is it's not it's not my wasting the council's time. It's an incompetent management of the ordinance of a faulty ordinance. Okay. So the request is to get, have a hearing, have the council order somebody to take it. To hold, An hold impartial it body. And, and it's not the same people who have been defending this, you know, in, okay. uh, I think faulty I, ordinance. Made yourself clear. Does that answer your question, Carrie? Okay. Any yep. further discussion on this, uh, on uh, Tim's motion? Well, who will be that impartial body? <laughs> well, this, so I, if you choose to do that, then we would have to talk about that. And you don't, you, you could decide whether you, who, who you want or have us. Okay. Right now, the motion is to deny that request. But if the, if that doesn't pass and you choose to honor the request, the request that we can talk about, then how that request would be fulfilled. Okay. So we could, thank you. Yeah. Okay, are we ready to vote on uh, the motion? All those in favor, 
signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thanks, Kelly and Chief. Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, moving on. Uh, Council reports. Um, Palin? And no report. Tim? Uh, just a note, if you haven't seen it, the clothespin statue has arrived on State Street. It looks really good. Cool, I haven't seen it. I need to go to her uh, cell. Um, Sal, did you shake your head or something? Nothing, no report. Uh, Carrie? Um, Adrian? Okay. Um, just one thing for mayor's report. I note that today is uh, September 30th, or September 11th, the anniversary of the uh, terrorist attacks back in 2001. And I was listening to... Um, uh, retrospective on the radio today, and uh, it was just uh, striking the changes that were wrought by the, this one event uh, on a beautiful sunny day, kind of like today. And uh, life life is 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 very different than now than it was. Uh, 22, 23 years ago, and uh, not necessarily all for the better. And uh, so that's uh, that's all I have to say for that. I think a terrible tragedy for the people who were affected, and uh, I, in my opinion, led the United States into making some uh, serious uh, serious mistakes that I hope we can avoid in the future. Um, city clerk's report. Um, we had a lot of people asking about ballots, so I think it might be useful to mention that uh, State of Vermont will be sending out um, ballots to all people on the rolls on September 23rd, and that should conclude by October 1st. So you'll be getting your mail-in ballot soon. And the box will be open in the back of the building. To mm -hmm. It could be mailed it. back or we have the drop box. It could also be brought into City Hall. Um, if people don't receive a ballot, they can come in and vote early in person at City Hall or come in on Election Day and vote. Thank you. City Matt, oh, Tim, I'm sorry. On that count, just thinking, is there a, a voter registration option at the City Clerk's Office or is that? Yeah, you can come in and register to vote um, at City Hall at the City Clerk's Office. Anytime. Thanks. Right up to election day. We have I've been been there on election day and have people come in and register and vote for the first time in their lives. And it's uh, it's a really great thing when that happens. Um, well, I, could, I could also report um, our volunteer slots are all full for the election. So there's a lot of interest in helping out. And um, that's really great. Yeah. Yeah. City manager's report. Um, I don't have a lot to report this week. We, um, other than I did mention earlier tonight that we have a consortium of local governments kind of trying to put our heads together around issues uh, pertaining to unhoused people. And we're meeting again tomorrow. And um, one thing we did was share information about what we were doing. And it was all very much the same. I was surprised actually across the state. Um, Burlington's doing a little bit more. They have a little bit more resources, um, but they still technically don't allow people on public land. They've sort of looked the other way and provided services to them, but they still isn't technically permitted. And of course, we have inside info about how Burlington handles it too, which has been very helpful. And um, so the main goal is to come up with very specific asks for the state and to do that pretty quickly, uh, including some immediate immediate actions. Um, and hopefully that will be known soon. And certainly you know, we all need some help, uh, big help. And then also some, you know, our concern is just gonna say, well, we'll take it up in the session and then, you know, it doesn't, it's settled till the end of the session and then it's not effective till June 30 and there we go. And we got people 
you know, tonight. I don't have a place to go. So. All right, that's it. And that means we are uh, done at uh, 9.31 p.m. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>